So when the music goes off, that means uh, it must be time to start. So good morning. Uh, my name is Jamie Barnett. I'm the Chief of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau of the FCC. And welcome to our forum on the use of the 4.9 gigahertz band for public safety broadband services. I appreciate you braving the weather uh, coming in to come out. And uh, it's really my pleasure to kick off this event, uh, which brings together a distinguished group of panelists uh, from both the public safety community and the commercial sector to discuss a matter that I think is of great importance to the future of public safety communications. The topic of discussion today is the 4.9 gigahertz band. This is 50 megahertz of spectrum allocation designated for public safety broadband use. Although the commission tentatively concluded in 2000 not to allocate uh, this band for public safety services, commenters from the public safety community effectively argued that this use, uh, the use of this band would enable first responders to access new and emerging technologies that would help them perform mission critical tasks more safely and efficiently. And recognizing the need to support a diverse and evolving array of services and applications, the, com the Commission adopted rules in 2003 designed to ensure the users of this band would have as much operational flexibility as possible. So both fixed and mobile services are permitted in this band, and it can be used for both unattended and continuous operation, voice, data, and video operations. Over the last de uh, decade, public safety users across the country have used the 4.9 gigahertz band to support a wide range of services. So far, however, this band has yet to fulfill the potential as a spectrum resource for public safety. With the Commission's recent adoption of an order and further notice of proposed rulemaking addressing 700 megahertz public safety broadband networks, it's important to consider how the 4.9 gigahertz band can play a complementary role in supporting public safety broadband communications. Now today we've assembled two panels to address this important topic. The first panel will examine the current uses of 4.9 uh, and what types of services and applications are being supported today. How are 4.9 gigahertz systems configured and how are they implemented? The second panel will consider how to expand public safety's use of the 4.9 gigahertz band. What can be used to uh, improve the usability of the spectrum? Are existing rules and policies well designed to encourage its use? Are there technical and regulatory barriers uh, that we need to uh, overcome to in increase its use? And if so, how can we, how can we overcome them? So uh, thank you to our distinguished groups of panelists, uh, both, both sets, and to all of you who are following along either here present or, or on the web. And I look forward to a great discussion. Thank you so much. With that, I will turn it over to our first panel, the panel idea. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Oops. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, welcome, panelists. Um, as Jamie mentioned, uh, we have two panels today. Um, let me just take a minute and put this in context uh, for everyone. Um, the first panel will be discussing uh, public safety deployments using 4940. Uh, to 4990 megahertz spectrum, uh, 50 megahertz of spectrum. Uh, it's commonly referred to as 4.9 gigahertz band. Um, we have uh, one panelist on the phone from Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Um, the way we'll do this panel is um, I'll ask the panelists to briefly introduce themselves, uh, talk about their area of responsibility, the agency or company that they're with. Um, from there, I have a uh, set of questions. Uh, we'll have a dialogue, and then um, at the end, uh, we'll take some questions uh, from the audience. Um, so, thank you, sir. I was just getting to that. Um, so I'll start. I'm Pat Amadio. I'm chief of RF engineering uh, with the Emergency Response Interoperability Center here in the Public Safety Bureau. Um, I work on uh, RF and wireless projects and broadband within the bureau. Um, so with that said, I'll, uh, Bill, you can start. Uh, just introductions briefly, thanks. Okay. Uh, Bill Brown, uh, Radio and Wireless Manager with the Virginia Department of Transportation in Richmond. Uh, I'm Steve Devine. I'm the Interoperability Program Chair. Uh, I'm sorry, the Interoperability Program Manager for the Missouri Department of Public Safety in, uh, in Missouri. Uh, Mark Jules, uh, Chief Executive Officer for Avery RMS Group. Um, Martin Levithan, Senior VP, uh, Sales and Marketing for Strict Systems. We, we build uh, 4.9 megahertz infrastructure. Uh, Scott Wilder, a police officer, 27 years, um, Director of Technology for the uh, Brookline Police Department in Brookline, Massachusetts. 
And uh, on the phone, we should have somebody from Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Yeah, good morning. Uh, Lieutenant Mark Wilkins from the LA County Sheriff's Department, and I am currently the executive uh, planning manager for, for LA RICS, which is the Los Angeles Regional Interoperable Communication System. Thank you, Lieutenant Wilkins. Um, okay, so the first question is related to um, deployment and use of, uh, with public safety uh, equipment in the uh, 50 megahertz of spectrum, 4.9 gigahertz band. And uh, my question for the panelists is, is if they can share their experience with um, history of use, why they're using 4.9 gigahertz, um, deployments, um, topology, how the networks might be set up, um, any performance um, types of equipment that are used. Uh, and if the panelists could limit the uh, responses to uh, 10 minutes. Um, I believe that, and I believe each of the panelists has a presentation to share, so with that said, we'll again start with uh, Bill Brown. Uh, good morning, and um, thank you very much uh, to the FCC for inviting me. It's a uh, pleasure uh, to be here uh, and to represent the Virginia Department of Transportation and uh, the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. Um, we have the first, first slide up there. Uh, AASHTO is a um, nonprofit organization. Uh, if you have um, not familiar with it, that represents all 50 state uh, DOTs, District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico. Under that, there are many committees. Um, we'd like to recognize Bill Brownlow, our uh, telecommunications representative at, at the AASHTO staff, um, and uh, I'm chair of the elected chair of the special committee on wireless communications technologies. Uh, several years ago. All right. Thank you. And uh, John Horsley has been the executive director of Ash of Astro since I believe 1898. So <laughs> <laughs> um, we're very glad, very glad to be here because uh, we believe it's important to emphasize the critical role that transportation assets play in emergency response and, and uh, you know, first response and, and emergency response. Um, the more involved uh, and serious the incident, the event, uh, the more critical it becomes that uh, transportation is often the very first of all first responders. So uh, it's real important to keep um, transportation assets and organizations integrated into your regional communications plans, um, your exercises, and, and so forth. And so we're, we're glad to be here to represent the uh, transportation community today and work with other uh, emergency responders. I'll, uh, Describe quickly a real, uh, one of our initial uses for the 4.9 band. Uh, here you have an aerial, an aerial, aerial view of Interstate 64. You can see running west and east there. On the north side is the uh, one travel center at New Kent, and on the south side is the, is the eastbound. Our program manager had, uh, was able to lease a T1 line to bring Internet access for uh, your travelers to the westbound side, which is on the north part of the picture. But he was unable to get things, uh, get any internet or leased line for internet access to the eastbound, which was critical for travelers heading for, to Williamsburg, uh, to the Virginia Beach area, and turning south into the foreign countries of North Carolina and South Carolina. You can get your passport stamped there at that facility. Um, so this is an extension of a data network from the westbound side to the eastbound side, as you can see there. He tried to work with the state IT agency for six months. They estimated it would cost $70,000 uh, to establish internet service on the eastbound side. Within three weeks of the time we were found out of the requirement, our, our wireless shop in VDOT put in a link uh, for less than $5,000, providing T1 and internet access, or providing internet access to the eastbound side, uh, as well as connecting <laughs> security cameras uh, and so forth, back and forth. You can see uh, we have a 36 megabit per second link, uh, 20 times the bandwidth of a T1 that was, you know, for one time cost of under $5,000 compared to a T1 cost of $300 to $400 a month for leasing. Just a quick picture. Uh, as you can see, a typical panel antenna used on 4.9 on the, the westbound side and then on the eastbound side. And it, we found this has typical characteristics of a uh, 4.9 system, quick deployment, high bandwidth, low cost, eliminate leased lines, uh, high reliability. It's been on the air for 40 months and hasn't been down one second yet. 
And another another plug for us wireless professionals and agencies, you know, please work please work with us and make your requirements known uh, to your in-house communications professionals. So uh, we, you know, we try and stay up on things. We're we're not we're not too bad actually. Um, more typically, uh, DOTs. Uh, well, let me get this in. And this is a typical shot of a of a management screen you would use on a 4.9 system. You can see signal strengths uh, available and used throughput. Uh, this is an Ethernet only. Uh, system we had, but that's a typical management screen you find with 4.9 systems. Um, it's easier to get information out to travel the traveling public now using websites such as 511 Virginia, and most states have these where you can access cameras and road conditions. Uh, or on the right side, uh, I showed a little screen grab of all the different Twitter links you can get through the Virginia Department of Transportation so that you get updates uh, quickly from uh, anytime there's a snag, you can target a specific interstate or a region so you don't get tweets about something happening 300 miles away. You can pick Northern Virginia or I-95 North, something like that. And so information from the traffic management center in a DOT to the traveling public is getting quicker. But what good is that if, if the information you know, is, not, is not current and up to date? And that's where we're using 4.9 a lot. Uh, typically, states use it to relay cameras, programmable message signs. Um, weather devices and so forth. Uh, we use 4.9 to backhaul to traffic management centers. If you have zombies ahead, that's something the, the public needs to know, to know about right away because they're quite frequently um, confused with Ohio State Buckeye fans, so we need to know the difference. <laughs> uh, historically, um, devices were added along the roadways and communications was added, were, added, were added piecemeal for leased lines and so forth, and it's not unusual for different states uh, to have upwards of one to two million dollars invested in leasing communications lines every every year, and once you can saw, a lot of states are trans are migrating to 4.9 systems along the interstates to, you know, to reduce a lot of expenses. Uh, here in New Hampshire, along I-93, um, see Dave Chase installing some 4.9 systems. As he said, last mile connectivity from a, an existing communications hub, hub or the end of a, of a fiber system, uh, backhauling video, roadway systems. Uh, changeable signs in case zombies show up, uh, variable speed limit signs for fog and ice and so forth. Um, Washington State is very well organized for communications and they have a lot of, a lot of use of 4.9 as you can see here are some of the same things, You're getting video and information back to the traffic management center, pan tilt zoom cameras, um, connectivity to some of their offices. Uh, 4.9 deploys quickly and can you be used for gaps in fiber systems very easily. And again, their savings, uh, they point to the savings here. Uh, some of the characteristics they've used, distances up to 21 miles with 10 megabits uh, per second connectivity. Uh, typical link on their contract at $3,400, very, very uh, cost effective. And you can see some of their future plans, uh, another 50 locations, 64 li locations pending licensing, uh, budgeted for 66 more locations. Um, so Washington's really using using it a lot. Well, Massachusetts here, we see another 20 systems on 4.9 plan to uh, install along the interstate for the same sorts of reasons, uh, controlling digital message signs, video uh, cameras, and so forth. And again, he cites uh, extending uh, connectivity from a fiber optic system out into the field. And again, uh, difficult areas, as he mentions here, uh, um, installing it along a bridge for 4.9 is very good for getting into difficult areas. Uh, Texas also, they point to controlling flood water pumps along I-27 north of uh, Lubbock where the frequent heavy thunderstorms. Last mile connectivity from the fiber, uh, you know, from a fiber connection. And again, he points to an area called Ranger, Ranger Hill, an area where it's difficult to get any sort of communications into, but 4.9 um, you know, installs quite easily. And, um, you can control a, a lot of activities, a lot of devices. There's a lot of bandwidth available on 4.9. And again, Maryland also the same things. Um, Phil uh, likes to uh, prefers the 6 and 11 gigahertz and a good whiskey bar, but he'll use 4.9 until he gets 6 and 11 uh, licensed. Also in, Wy in Wyoming, um, building an Ethernet IP backbone using 4.9, connecting ITS devices, um, creating run redundant communications means into the cities. Um, they plan to develop a deployable radio site on wheels on 4.9, so they will have uh, emergency communications 
at a, at a, you know, at a field site, at an emergency site. So again, in, in the, by use, use of 4.9 in the transportation area, the emphasis primarily is to get critical and accurate information to the traveling public as, uh, as quickly and as accurately as possible. Um, getting rid of lease communications, which maybe have slow bandwidths, uh, by replacing them with a high internet, uh, IP-based Ethernet system over 4.9 back to the traffic, regional traffic management center or, or statewide traffic management, management center. It's becoming more and more widely used across the DOTs, and we really do appreciate the FCC making this band available. Uh, we do have, there are some concerns, what if a mobile network moves in where you have a point-to-point -point system, if a city or a county deploys uh, my thoughts there are to use horizontal pol polarization on the point-to-point. -point. You can create 24, 26 dB separation to the, a mobile network that moves in, which will be primarily or exclusively mobile, I mean vertical polarization. And again, um, some of the highlights for transportation is very, very affordable, high bandwidth and reliable. As I said, our system has been on the air for 40 months without one second being down. So we do plan to use 4.9 to expand our emergency response uh, capability, and we do appreciate the FCC making this band available, and more please. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Um, I did have one follow-up question. Uh, on one of the slides, and you, you mentioned that uh, you had zero downtime in 40 months. I was wondering if you can comment on what you attribute that to besides possibly the equipment. I know the equipment is reliable. Um, is there anything else you can say about why there was zero downtime? And With, uh, in this case, it is a short, it is, it is a short throw, uh, but the main thing I think with this equipment, modern microwave equipment, and the downsize, there's not as much heat as there was, you know, in older microwave equipment uh, when I was younger. So the, the solid state microwave equipment produces very little heat. It's very reliable. Frequency is very stable. Um, this is a short throw. We engineered it and did a little testing. Uh, it's barely half mile long, which is well within the range, but it does sh shoot through about 100 yards of trees in the median. Uh, there's a bank of dirt, you know, berm too in the median, but we we get through it because it's a short short distance. But so we did engineer it as best we could. Um, it's not an ideal because it's not exactly line of sight. There's a lot of trees and dirt you know, <laughs> in between, but we tried it and, and we thought it would be stable and work. But I think the main thing is the just the state of the art of the equipment. That's great. Thanks, um, Steve. Thank you, Pat, and uh, thanks to the commission for. Uh, putting on this uh, workshop. Um, I had the, uh, um, uh, the, the good fortune of being involved in the, the rules development of 4.9 gigahertz uh, within the uh, National Public Safety Telecommunications Council in 2003-2004. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the background, where it came from, what the expectations were, and tie that into some of the use today, and then maybe some of the opportunities for tomorrow. So I may, I may take a little uh, a different tinge from, uh, from Bill's. Um, the, uh, it's important to note that the expectations when the rules were created were, were the landscape was considerably different. Uh, wideband data had been allocated to public safety. There was a, uh, uh, an expectation of mobile data uh, coming from that, and, and 4.9 uh, was, was really kind of our future, and we're kind of looking forward to that. So uh, a lot of the rules have, have changed, and a lot, of the, uh, uh, a lot of the landscape has changed. So uh, kind of a revisit to 4.9 and, and how to best utilize it is, is uh, certainly in order. Um, it's important to note also, this is the first allocation uh, that was really specifically to utilize COTS devices. Um, we, we, we fought hard against a, a lot of uh, folks, uh, particularly in the vendor community, to, to ensure that 802.11a uh, emission masks and such, or emission masks compatible with 802.11a, primarily those that had been already created for a DSRC uh, A and C, uh, were created and were utilized and were permissible. And, and there was a lot of opposition within the vendor community and public safety's vendor community to say that that emission mass needs to be unique and part of a niche market. And, and several of us fought hard for that to happen. So uh, the commission allocated it, uh, speaking to commercial off-the-shelf the devices, and uh, many of us fought hard to, to continue to allow that to happen. Um, the, um, I'll make some other recommendations at the end. I'll go ahead and put the slides up, if you would. We'll go through those. Um, uh, it's real important to note one of the reasons why, as I spoke earlier, we spoke to the, uh, uh, the 802.11a mask and wanted to make sure we, uh, we were able to access the uh, COTS devices was because of the spectrum uh, in, the, in the uni band 52, 54, 57, 58. Uh, there was a, a great desire to make sure that, uh, that we weren't an island 
uh, N49, and uh, there's been some changes, and there's quite a bit of bandwidth, a couple hundred megahertz of spectrum available there uh, down the road. So there was a lot of that uh, anticipated to be able to leverage the five gig market when we went through this. Um, again, we fought hard against other competing interests to try to make it a niche market. Um, it, uh, we, we feel the uniband is really something maybe, uh, you know, who's to say down the road five gig won't be as prevalent in some of our handset devices down the road as what we see two gig today. Uh, that may be a number of years down the road, but we think there, that synergy uh, will allow some real access to a, some, some commercial availability for public safety, specifically to use 4.9 and then to leverage the, the, the unibands in areas where it's, uh, where it's available. Uh, today, public safety uses, uh, when uh, I also am the chair of the National Regional Planning Council, which is all the uh, 7 800 megahertz regional planning committees for public safety uh, in each state and each region. Uh, what we're finding is a lot of the 4.9 use, uh, more so than what we initially anticipated, is really being used for backhaul, low bandwidth backhaul applications, bringing audio from a voting site back to a dispatch center, those kind of things, which really wasn't the intent. It was permissible in the rules. Uh, it's, uh, it's since been made a secondary application if it's not supporting broadband. Uh, so we really ha were surprised at the amount it was, uh, as compared to a recurring cost for a phone circuit, it was, as Bill had indicated, it was inexpensive, it was effective, and uh, they, could, uh, they could do it, uh, it rather quickly, uh, and rural agencies in particular liked the fact that there wasn't recurring costs. So we're seeing a lot of that low bandwidth um, uh, voice backhaul um, at 4.9 in some instances. Uh, some point-to-multi-point applications, of course, are out there as well, as well as surveillance and hotspot access, uh, tactical wireless uh, uh, lands, and air-to-ground video, of course, is, uh, is available uh, under waiver, uh, but that's also available, and there's a lot of folks taking advantage of that. Um, the, uh, the important thing, another thing about 5 gigahertz and, and 4.9 is no different. Uh, basically, the, the power permissible really uh, aggregates uh, is, is tied to bandwidth uh, till you get to 20 megahertz and after 20 megahertz that's kind of your sweet spot because the power uh, el you're not really allowed to expand or go any higher and, and transmit power beyond that uh, so everybody seems to think that 20 megahertz works well for the 50 megahertz and 4.9 that's beneficial uh, again as I indicated there's two emission masks available DSRC A and DSRC is a dedicated short-range communications associated under ITS or intelligent <coughs> transportation DSR A and C masks, um, and the transmit power is associated with that. That DSR C A fits within the 802.11a emission mask, which gives us that COTS eligibility. Um, again, there's your point-to-point -point and uh, some of your uh, air-to-ground video, and also some wireless LAN, LAN capabilities uh, that we, we see also. And also, we anticipated mesh environments uh, to also be something that 4.9 could be utilized. We think in the future there's some, the, again, it's really beneficial we're having this workshop and and that we get a fresh look at 4.9. Uh, we think there's some changes that can be made to enhance uh, its effectiveness and, and make it uh, more practical now that we know some of the uses in the field. Um, the, uh, it does, it, it can, with the proper applications, provide the reliability, security, QoS, and prioritization that, that public safety seeks, and 4.9 is capable of that. Uh, I think it's important to note that it's really important that we utilize 4.9 knowing the path loss, knowing the, the propagation characteristics, and making sure that the applications fit the band. Uh, we know that it doesn't have a whole lot of benefit on the mobile side, and, and there's a lot of other initiatives speaking to that these days. That said, we think that there are a lot of event-driven applications that 4.9 can speak to, uh, some file transfers, some things uh, uh, on a smaller uh, incident-based uh, network that make it a lot, a lot more available and perhaps can complement some 700 broadband initiatives or other, other data initiatives down the road. So we think 4.9 in its place, the regional planning committees uh, feel that it's, it's valid given the right application. It also wouldn't be appropriate in the wrong application. Um, vehicular area networks, sensing, personal area networks, really event-driven and incident-driven uh, applications we really think speak to the uh, effectiveness of the band. Again, hopefully being able to utilize uh, COTS devices as well. One other thing that's important to note, and we would make just as a recommendation, the, uh, the band is, is, consists of really five or eight five megahertz blocks. Uh, I'm sorry, ten five megahertz blocks, with the first and the last being, uh, being able to be utilized in one megahertz slices. Because of the low bandwidth applications we see uh, in uh, some of these rural areas, we think down the road it may be more effective for the rules to reflect uh, a one megahertz 
slice of spectrum being dedicated for that low bandwidth backhaul <coughs> and being required for those non-broadband uh, applications and then leaving the 40 megahertz of spectrum more available for broadband applications. So we, we'd like to see down the road, uh, today 49 is available, licenses uh, are available for jurisdictions. Uh, the city of police can get a license, the city of fire can get a license, the city of road district can get a license, and we have found that that's causing more confusion and lack of cooperation intra-cities or intra-jurisdictions. We'd like to see some of that uh, maybe cooperatively, uh, a single jurisdictional license where folks can utilize that effectively and manage those uh, across their uh, their departments within a single jurisdiction, whether that be state, county, or city. So, thank you, Pat. Thanks, Steve. Um, just uh, one quick follow-up question. I know we're going to talk about it in the second panel, but you touched a little bit about possibly improving the band. What, what was what would be the single most, or one thing you would point to as far as trying to improve the use? Um, I, I think. Uh, one of the things that, that we as the regional planning committees uh, really feel is, is there are tools out there to allow some coordination of the use of the band, whether that be for backhaul applications or, or video transfers or access points or hotspots. We'd like to really see a, a, uh, a loosely based coordination requirement of 49 being put for the licensees uh, to allow uh, a, a national database, which already exists and actually has, a, has the ability to capture 49 information real site location, so I can turn around and say, I want to put 49 in, I can go to this database and see what my neighbors are using, not just, not just what their license is, that's rather easy to find, uh, but, the, but the, uh, the, uh, the technical elements associated with that license, where they're doing, if they are doing backhaul, what's their height, can I operate, you know, do I have vertical separation, a lot of that stuff, we think there are, it, it's an easy fit for the rules to point to say there needs to be some coordination at the state or at the regional level to allow dialogue back and forth between users, so. Right. Great, thanks sure. Steve. Sure. Hey Mark, you next. Thank you. Um, thank you uh, Pat uh, for all your efforts and, uh, and to the commission for, uh, for having us. Um, we can go right to the slides actually. Um, so every RMS group uh, designs and deploys a uh, very wide area network, uh, public safety, um, public safety networks. And um, when you look at what customers ask us to run across these networks, um, as well as um, what kinds of, uh, of places we're pulling video from, it's very easy to see why 4.9 is absolutely critical for us. Um, so, so what are we running across these networks? Uh, voice, data, and video. And video really being the key one as far as the bandwidth hog. Um, that, uh, y you know, agencies want high resolution fluid video, which takes up a lot of bandwidth. And we want to not only pull that voice, data, and video, but we want to push it um, out over very uh, wide areas. Um, as far as the kind of areas we're pulling across, um, across cities, uh, universities, ports, stadiums, um, from police cars, from mobile tripods, mobile command and control centers, as well as fixed command and control centers. Um, so it's very easy to see when you are uh, pulling and pushing video over those sorts of areas um, and that much um, bandwidth, uh, Y49 is, is, is so critical. Um, if, oops, if, uh, if you look at our customers, it's easy to see we don't have an average customer, and that's why uh, 4.9 is also important to us. Um, everything from police departments to departments of transportation to Customs and Border Patrol to FBI, um, and in all shapes and sizes, so that they're uh, from the, uh, the northern border to the southern border, from coast to coast, and um, it, it can be from a department that only wants to hang a few cameras to a department like Chicago that wants to pull thousands of cameras um, over hundreds of square miles. Um, so as you can imagine, to be able to satisfy the needs of such a wide range of customers, you, you really need to utilize the 49 space. Um, You'd think an IT guy could figure out the remote control the first time, mm. but uh, 
But in addition to uh, to those customers, a lot of them have um, special events. Uh, so we did the uh, Democratic and, and Republican national conventions, uh, the, the inauguration, G20 in Pittsburgh. Um, and as you can imagine, those sorts of events also have a whole host of, um, of flexibilities that you need to be able to deal with and, um, and again, make, uh, make assuring that you're going to get um, high quality video and, and good voice and data is, um, is important. Um, if you look at why, um, so if you look at all those customers and, and then look at, at what we kind of look for with uh, 4.9, the first we've kind of talked about it and that's that it's very robust. Um, so we're pulling an awful lot of information and, and we're also pushing it. Um, the second is, is that it needs to be very scalable. Um, why every agency we work with would like to, from day one, blanket um, every possible inch of their area, um, they're usually not able to. They're usually using uh, funds that are either out of operational budgets or um, from grants, and that doesn't allow them to, uh, to do everything at once. So 4.9 really allows us to very easily scale. Um, we have cities that will start with a $70,000 project and add, uh, you know, year by year and end up spending millions of dollars, um, and, and 4.9 gives you that. Um, we, we also look for flexibility. Um, for those of you that remembered, uh, uh, during the DNC, a, a few short weeks before, uh, President Obama moved from, uh, moved the venue for his speech. Um, and all those agencies had to be able to very quickly respond to that move. Um, and the 4-9 gave us the, uh, the flexibility to satisfy their, their requirements. Um, mobility, a, a huge one, to get um, very, uh, very large amounts of throughput down to police cars. Um, we pull video off of uh, patrol boats, both thermal and high-res day-night video. Um, we, we push all kinds of data down to uh, different command and control vehicles. So mobility is absolutely crucial. and. Um, and all of those mobile units really have become mobile offices. Um, it's not all right anymore to just have a, a very small amount of throughput. Um, all of the folks on those mobile units want all of the information they would expect to get if they were at their desk. Um, very diverse uh, geographies. Um, you know, if you look at the terrain um, down on the southern border for Customs and Border Patrol, um, if you look at ports that have tides coming out, if you look at uh, cities that have bridges and tunnels, rivers that freeze, all, all of that, um, you really need a wide range of flexibility, which, uh, which 4.9 gives you. Um, quick installation, as some of the other um, panelists mentioned, uh, again, especially with events like the Super Bowl, G20, um, you just don't have the amount of time that you would like. Um, and numerous manufacturers uh, were lucky today to have Strix, which is a well-known manufacturer and a highly reliable one. Um, but, but there's a many, many, many manufacturers out there um, in point-to-point, point-to-multipoint mesh. And it really takes a very large toolbox when, when you talk about doing these kind of deployments um, in all different kinds of areas. So um, having a lot of manufacturers to rely on really helps. Um, and, and of course, uh, everyone's best friend, interference. Um, as you can imagine, when, when you go to New York City DOT or you go to a city like Bayonne, New Jersey, which you might not think would have a lot of interference, but sits between New York City and Newark Airport, um, being able to know that you have a space like 4-9 um, that, that you're going to be able to run in is, is very important. Um, and all of these agencies are really relying on this. Um, if you look during the inauguration, um, the fact that they knew that video, that voice, that data would be available was critical to their planning. Um, so in addition to the reliable equipment and, and good design, you really need that uh, reliable space. Um, and I think, Pat, we were going to do the different applications in the next question, or did, did yeah. you want to go through them? Yeah, I have a further question on applications. Um, so, Mark, one follow-up question. If I'm a public safety agency and uh, I have some video applications, or uh, if I'm deploying a system, why would I use 4.9 um, as opposed to another spectrum band? I mean, you mentioned some things in your presentation, uh, high bandwidth, data rates, and so forth, but can you comment on that a little bit? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, public safety, uh, especially for video, um, you really need a uh, proven technology, a proven space, um, and and uh, and you need to know that it's it's going to be working. Um, public safety officials use that tool um, of video that's running over that the same as they would use um, any you know their firearm or anything else that they rely on. So. Just like it wouldn't be acceptable for them to jump in their police car and have it not start, it's not acceptable for them to be running in a frequency where, um, you know, that's not reliable, and it's not acceptable for them to to not have um, pretty much as much bandwidth as they need, as much throughput as they need. Thank you, sure. um, Martin. I believe you're next. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, First of all, thanks to the Commission for organizing this, and thanks to, to uh, Pat for all of his uh, helpful input here. Uh, and thanks to Mark for the plug. I appreciate it. Um, we, um, uh, if you could put the first slide up, please. Yeah, do I need that clicker? Oh, yeah, yeah sorry. thank you. Uh, so, uh, I'm Martin Levitin with Strict Systems, as I had said before. I'm going to be talking uh, uh, about. Um, a number of installations of uh, wireless networks that we have <coughs> deployed. Um, 4.9 uh, is the focus here. And, and so I'll be talking about a number of different deployments, and I'll also uh, talk a little bit about our approach uh, to this marketplace, because it's, it, you might find it slightly different than the more traditional 4.9 gigahertz only approach. So moving to the, uh, to the next slide. Uh, Quick background on Strict Systems. We're a Silicon Valley-based <coughs> company, been around for about 10 years. Uh, we actually sell our product uh, in a number of different countries, U.S., overseas, Far East, Europe, et cetera. Uh, we uh, focus on multi-user, multi-application networks, uh, not, not just purely public safety. And our, our basic strategy in this market is to say, if you can put uh, video surveillance, if you can put public safety, uh, CAD systems on the same network that the water department can be using, uh, that potentially commercial subscribers can be using as well, then the cost efficiency of these applications and the eventual cost to the city and to the public safety organizations will be reduced. So, so, so we specialize in networks that can support uh, multiple applications, and all of our equipment basically has a number of different radios in them supporting 2.4, uh, 4.9, 5.8 uh, gigahertz. We've even put some up with, uh, 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 with 900 megahertz, et cetera. Uh, so that's our approach uh, to the marketplace. We're primarily a mesh vendor. That's where most of our equipment is deployed, but we also <laughs> do point to multipoint depending on the, on the situation. So, uh, oops. Uh, I'm used to flipping it on my computer screen, so I forgot. There we go. Uh, this is just to give you some idea of the uh, particular deployments that we have done. Uh, we operate in four market sectors, uh, public safety, municipal, service provider, and transportation. The uh, deployments listed with the little asterisks next to them are all 4.9 deployments. We've done a lot of public safety in various places that are not 4.9. In some cases, they were pre-4.9. In other cases, they were in overseas locations where 4.9 is not uh, relevant. Um, it's sometimes <coughs> hard to differentiate what the, uh, the type of a network that you're talking about. It could be municipal, and they're using 4.9 for public safety, or it could be primarily a public safety network, and the municipal applications follow. So I've done the best job I could of, of categorizing it. I'm going to talk about some specific applications here in a minute. Uh, the first network that we deployed, in fact, uh, with 4.9 that was a multi-use network was in Brookline, Mass. But uh, Scott Wilder is here, and he's going to be talking about that network. So I'm just going to skip past that and leave the Brookline story to Scott. Um, so um, Framingham, Massachusetts, another, uh, another suburb of Boston, is another place where we've deployed a multi-use network. Uh, the primary use is, is with the Department of Public Works. Uh, to, uh, for people on, on the road, basically, and in addition uh, to uh, uh, monitor various assets, either with video surveillance or, or with SCADA, 
uh, on, on pumping stations, but they are also beginning to use that for both video surveillance in selective neighborhoods as well as for the police to access uh, remotely. Uh, that particular network at the moment covers an area of about 12 square miles. There's about 500 nodes up and running on, on that one. So that's, that's, that's one example of a 4.9 application in the U.S. Um, a second one is out in Idaho, Pocatello, Idaho. Uh, this is actually uh, a transportation-based network where people are out on the road uh, using it for both the transportation department as well as the police, including access as well as video surveillance. And this uses both 4.9 as well as uh, 2.4 for access, and the backhaul is largely um, 5.8 gigahertz. And if you can, l oops, I apologize to the audience. I'm falling behind. Pat, you should have whacked me on this one here. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, here's uh, here's a, a picture of the uh, actual deployment. As you can see, it runs along uh, this road here, and we've got about 80 devices uh, uh, linearly deployed at about a half mile apart. A and a key operational point here is that there are only about, um, there are just three access points to get in there. So the backhaul uh, that you need, which is the ex typically tends to be the expensive part of this of uh, these networks is actually uh, minimized. Uh, Pittsburgh, California, this is a pure video surveillance network. This what predates 4.9, and so this, actually, this network actually does not operate on 4.9. If it were being deployed today, it would. And they've actually had quite a bit of success in identifying uh, uh, you know, criminal acts, uh, keeping track of behavior, and it's actually led to a number of convictions. So this is actually quite a good success story. Um, Oh, thank you, Scott. I'm, I think I'm, my age is beginning to show on me because I forget to push this thing here. Um, or it's the weather, I don't know. Uh, anyway, Darwin, Australia. This is, uh, this is an interesting one, and I think it, 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 it begins to point out a topic that I wanted to address uh, that has to do with where would you use 4.9 and where would you use 700? Uh, that seems to be a topic of growing interest today. Uh, this particular network in Darwin, Australia, has 109 cameras that we deployed in around a 10 squ square mile area. So that's about 10 cameras per square mile. Uh, if you, uh, that's a lot of bandwidth, uh, especially this, in this situation, the cameras are all multicast and you know uh, how consumptive those tend to be. The, the only real way to deal with a network of that sort is you need bandwidth and, uh, and 4.9 would be inappropriate. Uh, uh, network to deploy that on. If you try to deploy this on 700, I think you'd be out of gas pretty quickly. Um, Beijing Olympics is another example where video <coughs> surveillance was a heavy player. Uh, another transportation project that we did in Korea, this involves uh, video surveillance and access using mobility. Uh, and this requires, again, a lot of bandwidth. Uh, if this were deployed in the U.S., it would have been using 4.9. In Korea, that particular frequency is not is not relevant. So, um, moving on quickly, I'm watching my timer shrink slowly into the sunset here. Um, uh, our focus in this business has been to provide enough capacity to handle all of the applications, especially video surveillance, and, and we basically go at this with our standard Wi-Fi equipment and, in addition, our 11N equipment, which has more capacity. But if you if you if you Good God. If you just look at this chart, I think you'll see that uh, in a particular area that might cover four square miles, we're talking about a potential capacity of four gigabits per second. That, that's more than enough to deal with any video surveillance applications that y you need to do. And the core uh, access mechanism for either cameras that are deployed or for uh, subscriber units in, in police vehicles or stationary or handhelds is, is 4.9. So that's, that's the approach in this particular uh, architecture. Um, the, the basis for, for, bas for this whole thing <coughs> is uh, the ability to carry lots of traffic over many hops because, as you know, these mesh networks, which are highly reliable, take many hops to, to cover the area, and, and, and that was the basis of our technology platform. So, uh, getting down to the question, when is uh, 
a 700 appropriate and when is uh, 49 appropriate. This particular chart shows um, a frequency plan which uh, would be deployed using 700 on the left, assuming that you had all 25 uh, megahertz of frequency available, which you don't, and then uh, uh, 4.9 on the right. I think th the point is well taken. Every time you have a 20 megahertz channel, you can pump bandwidth through it. Every time you have a 6 megahertz, sh megahertz channel, your bandwidth is limited. So if you really want to do capacity, it, you really have no option. So, so at the end of the day, the question is, um, you know, is there some way to make these two things work together? And the answer is surely. Uh, you can deploy mesh in some areas with 4.9 access. You can deploy 4.9 access where you need the capacity, even if it's out of a mesh coverage area. And to do the wide area for voice or for low speed data, you can, you can use 700. So, th so there are two systems that are possible uh, to use. Um, it would be nice. Uh, if uh, a single vendor had the ability to carry both the 700 and the 492458 on a single platform, uh, if 700 had the 802.11 uh, uh, infrastructure protocol on it, they could at the moment. Uh, the 700 is on LTE, so that's not possible. Now, uh, we've actually done situations where you can do up and down converters. Uh, but uh, that's going to get to be much too expensive. Uh, so it would be nice. So my comment is 700 can have its uses to complement 4.9, but it would be nice if everybody was on the same operational protocol so that we wouldn't have disparate systems. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, a, couple, a couple of the slides, um, various public safety agencies were using. I think you mentioned OWS product and another one. Um, can yes. you explain the difference? Uh, one of them, the mesh network, I think, was using OWS product, and then yeah, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I will be glad to. I I didn't include any product information because I figured that would be uh, too pushy yeah. for a, a panel of this sort. Uh, our products are distinct. We basically have three classes of products: uh, outdoor infrastructure products, uh, the OWS systems, the uh, subscriber unit products that, that you can put in a police car or, uh, or, or in a building. Uh, those are edge products and they're typically labeled MWS, mobile wireless systems. And then we have indoor products called IWS that you, that you, that you use uh, internally. The outdoor systems, OWS, typically come with six radios, 258s, 124, and, and 149. And uh, that's the way they're deployed in, in these networks. The 49 and 24 for access, and the 58 is, is backhaul. And we use the 58 for backhaul just because there's a lot of frequencies, around 200 megahertz around there, and you can move around from frequency to frequency to avoid congestion. And so that's, that's the approach. Does that okay. answer the question? Yeah, that's perfect. I wanted to clarify what was being used for what app okay. application and implementation. Great. Um, Scott, I think you're next. Thanks. Thank you, Pat. Um, thank you all for letting me uh, come here and uh, give you the Brookline story. Um, my presentation is really not going to be all that high tech as uh, everybody else has spoken. Uh, if we could put the slides up now. Um, I'm going to talk about how Brookline, Massachusetts has deployed 4.9, how we've been using it for over three years now. We're using it as a broadband mesh network for public safety. And um, you know, quite simply, the, the story starts off with um, we in Brookline, we're basically 6.8 square miles surrounded by the three sides by the city of Austin, had terrible, pick any vendor you want, uh, um, coverage out there for uh, any of our, uh, our wireless devices, uh, cell phones, uh, Wi-Fi cards, whatever. All vendors were really interested in uh, building towers in Brookline, but um, Brookline wasn't too interested in having towers erected in Brookline. So uh, this was really where we started our journey um, looking into a, a, a wireless uh, network. And this is basically a, a public-private partnership that I really won't spend too much time talking about. But uh, you know, it was built out as a, two, it's a, a dual 2.4, 4.9 network. 4.9 actually uh, just being for the uh, folks here and, and the public safety side. Uh, the 2.4, the um, town of Brookline, the municipal offices, uh, have up to 10% of that 2.4 pipe to run their applications. And the rest, Galaxy, which is the vendor that built out the next work, is 
basically selling their services, um, and that's how they're recuperating the, the cost of the network. Um, you know, basically, we looked at 4.9, and uh, early on we had a lot of vendors coming to us, and we were looking at it, trying to convince us that we should just be 2.4, don't talk about 4.9. Uh, this 4.9 stuff really isn't going to work for what you're looking to do. Um, well, I, I think we, we proved some folks wrong. It, uh, it's been a, a, a champion for us. We, like I said, we've been using it um, 24 by 7 for over three years now. Uh, what I was able to do is get away from 35 air cards, um, so the cost of that being $40 a month that we were pay, uh, paying for our air cards out in our cruises to uh, when we moved over to the, this, this install in the 4.9, um, so those reoccurring costs go away. It basically cost me $1,200 per car. Uh, that's for the, for the radio, the antenna, um, and all the equipment that uh, connecting up to the, uh, to the laptop. As you can see, I've, I've been trying to push a lot of people. I got my uh, um, link here for the FCC. Hopefully, uh, folks will go on and, and get a 4.9 license. And we've been doing it, um, like I said, we, we've been doing it as a mobile office, per se, for our offices out on the street. Uh, when we had uh, traditional air cards out there, we had limited bandwidth. There was only so much that we could do. Um, with this, um, we are able to do an awful lot more beside our CAD, our RMS. I have two video camera, two different video camera networks out there that uh, are attached to the system. Um, some applications like GIS are um, a very big bandwidth intensive applications that we couldn't really push out there, but we now have uh, all the vehicles uh, have a link where they can get into our, our GIS database, bring up the floor plans for all our town buildings, all our schools, and the local colleges uh, that are in, uh, in the town of Brookline. As well as in the vehicles, we can run uh, stolens, uh, license plates, uh, wanted persons, the traditional stuff you could do off of um, off of any of the uh, traditional air cards that were connected into the uh, into your vehicles, uh, as well as um, training documents and training videos, we're now available to to move these pieces out into the field. So the officers, uh, as they're working, um, if they have a break, they can bring up, see what the newest training bulletins are. If we have any training um, uh, videos out there that are appropriate, all that is now available to them from the vehicle. Emergency management database, again, here's another pretty intensive database that was basically in three ring binders and a couple of patrol cars. Um, and now, basically, every vehicle out there has access to this, again, because they're all using the, um, the Wi-Fi network as an extension of my public safety network. So when they log on to the network, just as they were a, a workstation within uh, my building, they get the same, the same rights, the same privileges. Uh, Comstat reports, policies, general orders, all these pieces that an office can now have available to them on this shift, again, because of having this high-speed pipe that we didn't have before. And as I said, the, the units out on the street are attached to my network. They have a, a static IP address. I look at them as just another workstation out there. It makes it easy for me to manage uh, anything. Um, uh, as far as uh, updates, um, any type of um, uploads that have to go up there, the active directory rules follow them in the vehicles. Uh, if we open the vehicles up to certain websites, we're able to uh, only allow certain websites to be uh, accessed from the vehicles. So it basically, to me, that's where it makes it really interesting when you're managing a network. When we had problems in the past, um, we'd have to go out to each and every laptop and um, do updates to 25, 35 different laptops, where now updates are, are automatically done over the field. Uh, what does it look like? Well, that's one of the strict nodes up on the, uh, that you'll see up there now. Those, we have around 35 to 40 per square mile in Brookline. And this is what we have uh, basically uh, for the cruises. We have this, uh, the antenna that's uh, installed on the roof deck of the cruiser under the light bar. That is the top white box. That's the Strix mobile unit. Uh, that's the radio that we have in the vehicle. It's currently Velcroed to one of uh, land mobile radio. So that's part two. And then we have a CAD 5 cable going from that Strix box in the trunk out to the laptop. 
All this is being managed by NetMotion. We're using the NetMotion application to keep the uh, persistent connection out there as well as doing some trade-offs. So when a vehicle leaves town, I have 10 vehicles or so that have, still have air cards. So when they leave town or when they get in areas that have uh, tough coverage, uh, the NetMotion will swap them automatically, seamless to the user, over to that, that new, to the air card. And basically the infrastructure topology, um, you know, this is what gets real exciting to us. Again, like I said, the data access, um, the video access, the, uh, the voice over IP that we'll be soon experimenting on the, uh, on the network is really the, uh, the applications getting out to the users. That's really where we, I see the, the huge benefit um, as far as being able to utilize a broadband network out in the, out in the vehicles. Um, basically, like, uh, like Martin mentioned, that the, 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 the nodes that are out there have six radios in them, uh, part of that being the 4.9, the 2.4, and the 5, as he mentioned. Uh, the other part that we have on built in the network is the public safety. We have the ability that if something catastrophic happens and we need more bandwidth, we can take over that, two, that entire 2.4 frequency out there that, we, that is, is being broadcasted through this. So we have that as a backup. We've never had to use it, but it's comforting to know that uh, we have uh, that built in. Uh, let's see, the, the mesh capacity to backhaul. Um, again, you know, the cost, basically, I, like I said, the, the whole cost to outfit a vehicle is uh, roughly $1,200. That's including the, the entire installation. And again, the applications. It's all about the applications. It's what you're able to deliver out to the field, out to your offices. Um, they're the folks that are responding to these calls. They now have information available to them that they never had before. And that's basically uh, my presentation. Um, opened up to any questions. Thanks, Scott. Uh, very good success story. Um, I'm actually familiar with a lot of cities that uh, don't allow any more towers. Um, so you kind of have to go on the light poles. Um, I'll probably come back to you. Um, I have another question related to incident response um, command centers, so um, I'll save that uh, for later. Um, do we still have Lieutenant Wilkins on the phone? Yes, actually you do, but although I was in panic mode about 45 seconds ago because we, we, uh, I got a, uh, a menu come up on the phone saying that uh, your conference call cut off because there's not enough people on the call. So, but, but we're back on. Okay, great. Uh, just a, a, a quick little disclaimer here. Uh, although my title may uh, suggest I am by no means a communication expert, uh, so I brought along my uh, one of my engineers, Jesse Loera, who's uh, quite familiar with 4.9. So uh, if we have any questions, uh, if I can't answer them, Jesse will probably be able to take care of that for me. Also, I don't know. You know, I'm a little blind here because my my webcast is getting cut out. So uh, I may. Uh, I may, we may get, I may get a little lost here, but uh, if I do, just please uh, get me back on track. If you can, if you can throw the first slide up for me. Yeah, just call off the slide numbers as you go along. Okay. Uh, well, you can skip right over number one, just go right to number two. Uh, I'll give you just a little bit of history. We started using 2.4 back in in uh, in 2000, and we primarily used it for for downlink video, and it, it worked well for us, aside from the congestion. Uh, it, it, you know, we had a little bit of congestion, and, and it was difficult, uh, you know, coordinating and, and maintaining the spectrum. Um, and, but for various political reasons, we stopped using it for about, uh, well, up until about two or three years ago. I'm sorry, did somebody say something? No, you can continue. Okay, I get a lot sorry. of I'm getting a lot of feedback from the phone, so it's very difficult to to go here. All right, so we we started using it again about two or three years ago. Um, and or well, we considered using it again two or three years ago, and uh, we we pretty much decided to go right with uh, four point gigahertz or four point nine gigahertz. Um, I don't know what slide you're on. If you go to slide three, we currently have, and that's a misprint. If you're looking at that slide, there we currently have there's five agencies or public safety agencies in LA County that are that are using uh, or plan to use. 4.9, and, and primarily for you know for downlink video, video surveillance, and I think somebody mentioned earlier uh, backhaul options. I, I know that's not uh, what it was originally designed for, but 
we do have some folks that are going to be using it for that. Uh, if you want to switch to the next slide. In addition to uh, the Sheriff's Department, the LA County Internal Services Department is using uh, 4.9. 4 LA City Fire and Police Departments are both using 4.9. The Long Beach Police Department and uh, uh, LA County Fire Department will be using 4.9. <clears throat> and let me just add, the Sheriff's Department is not currently deployed 4.9 in any real-time uh, capacity yet. We have used it in a, in a training situation, and I'll get to that a little bit later, uh, but we haven't actually deployed it yet. Uh, the Internal Services Department has, and I'm sorry, you can go to slide five. The Internal Service Department has deployed it, and they're using it um, for point-to-multi-point point, uh, backhaul. They've got a hub in East Los Angeles, and then it connects to four different uh, uh, areas throughout L.A. County. Uh, East L.A. Courthouse, District Attorney's Office, um, our Child Support Services, and Alhambra Court. And I believe they're using the Alberion Breeze Max, uh, Breeze Max uh, equipment. And yeah, I think we just broke up there. If, uh, if I get that, I hope that's the right name, Alberion. You can uh, switch to the next slide, please. Hopefully we're on slide six. I don't, uh, I, I can't get it up on my computer here. Um, but LA City Fire and Police Departments are currently using uh, the 4.9 for, for download downlink uh, of airborne, uh, airborne video. And they've also recently installed a surveillance system in the LA County, uh, or uh, Los Angeles International Airport. I believe they're also, LAPD is also using it in a couple of different housing projects. Uh, they're high crime areas, and uh, from my understanding, they've been very happy with, uh, with how it's worked so far. If you want to switch to the next slide, you can see that Long Beach Police Department is also using it for their uh, video surveillance. They've got 13 different fixed locations uh, throughout their city, and their city is quite large, actually. And those those uh, cameras are, are set up in, and again, in high crime areas. Uh, if you want to go to slide eight, as I mentioned before, uh, neither the, the sheriff's department or the county fire department are using 4.9 yet. However, uh, we we actually both plan to deploy it here in the next couple of months once we've got a vendor selected and, and uh, we start uh, start building out. Uh, however, our main intention is to use it for downlink, down, uh, downlink of airborne video, uh, you know, uh, tactical situations, backhaul video, uh, and uh, uh, basically backhaul to our, to our main uh, communication centers, both the fire department's communication center and uh, LA County uh, uh, communication center. I know the fire department is also uh, planning on uh, using it along the coastline, um, and they, the, uh, the implementation plans to indicate the use of fire and tide mesh radios. I think uh, somebody mentioned the, the mesh earlier. If you want to go to slide nine, and that, uh, that specifically for the LA County Sheriff's Department, as I said, we, once we get it up and running, we plan to use it for airborne uh, video, um, and we're hoping, again, hoping to have a... Uh, uh, proposal out by next month and a vendor selected uh, uh, shortly after, thereafter. Now we are using it um, in training scenarios and, and again I'll speak to that later but just to give you a, a, uh, a heads up on it, it's, we have a, a, a program called the Communication Resources and Emergency Workaround uh, Team. It's, a, it's our crew team and what we have and what we'll be utilizing are, are uh, Harris Corporation uh, 7800 high capacity line of sight radios uh, and that's basically for quick deployment and, and point to point uh, 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 multi point wireless uh, IP inf infrastructure. Uh, gives us that, the, the high, high bandwidth data communication uh, between uh, mobile and fixed operation centers. And then, if you want to jump to uh, slide 10, we also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, plan on using uh, the 4.9 for, for airborne, uh, our downlink of the airborne video. Uh, and that will go directly to our tactical command centers and to our sheriff's communication centers. Um, the, I'm sorry, excuse me here. The countywide distribution of the download, uh, downlink video to uh, our, uh, our sheriff's department facilities, uh, our, our, we plan to use that with uh, directional antennas to link the signals back to the, our, our main communication center and our uh, emergency operations center 
which are both uh, about three miles outside of uh, downtown Los Angeles. If you go to slide 11, that kind of, I hope you got it up there, because I, again, I don't have it on my computer. That kind of shows you a, a layout of how we use 2.4. Uh, 2 um, it, it, we, once we get 4.9 up, we, we basically tend to use the same layout. Uh, you can just kind of look at that, uh, you know, at your own, at your leisure. If you want to switch to slide 12. Basically, LA County covers, covers an area of uh, over 4,000 square miles. We've got uh, almost 1,800 square miles of flat land, uh, another 1,800 uh, square miles of mountains, a couple hundred square miles of, uh, you know, just kind of hilly terrain, and then we've got another 60 miles of, of real mountain valleys. Um, uh, we've got some, uh, you know, 20, 30 miles of uh, marshland, and another, another 75 miles of, of uh, coastland. That's pretty much what our geography will, uh, our geographical layout is. If you want to go to slide 13. It's our hopes that uh, eventually uh, the, uh, the county sheriff's department and the fire department will uh, pretty much encompass most of L.A. County uh, by air and or ground using 4.9. Um, our ISD, our internal services uh, department, manages uh, uh, all the sites for the county sheriff and the county fire. And combined, you put them all together, we've got over 100 strategically located sites in all kinds of uh, uh, all types of terrain all throughout the, our jurisdictional boundaries. And if you want to jump to slide 14, please. Uh, just a little, a little bit on the equipment uh, that the ISD is using. The, uh, they have their Alvarian Breeze Max Extreme 5000. It's got outputs, or I'm sorry, throughputs between 13 and 14 megabits per second. And then the downlink, for the downlink, uh, 4 to 6 megabits per second. I'm oh, sorry, that, that 13, 14 was for the uh, downlink, and the 4.6 is on the, on the uplink. Um, our crew team uh, is currently using, and it has online to use, the, uh, the Harris RF7800 high-capacity line-of-sight radio. It has a uh, robust connectivity and Ethernet data rates greater than 80 megabits per second. Both the uh, installations are, are first-time operations and, and really don't, I mean, there's really no comparison to the 2.4 that, that we were previously using. Some of the issues, uh, you know, that, that we see coming from 4.9, uh, certainly interference with uh, neighboring public safety agencies, and really the fact that there's no, uh, there's, there's no established organization in terms of uh, how we're going to manage that spectrum, you know, from our perspective. Uh, also, the catalog, cataloging of the, uh, uh, of 4.9, you know, the use of it, or cataloging the use of it uh, uh, by the public, agent, uh, public safety agencies as they become operational. If you want to jump to slide 16, uh, and I think we already talked about this, um, you know, go ahead and switch over to slide 17. F the, uh, the FCC's Region 5 uh, developed a, uh, a ban plan uh, that uh, would include 4.9 uh, for, for ground and air operations <coughs> uh, back in November of, uh, of this past year. And uh, are we still there? Yes. Okay, sorry we lost you for a second. Okay, where are we at? Uh, slide 18. 18. Okay, back in 2009, uh, you know, the uh, the work, uh, the public safety working group or aerial working group was was uh, uh, put together to address some of the concerns that uh, you know the agencies had with uh, uh, the growing number uh, who operate or expect to operate uh, airborne video. Uh, in a meeting held in November, the three milestones were agreed upon. Uh, one, that a survey of all agencies in the area will be conducted to ter determine which agencies are currently using or intend to operate systems using the 4.9 spectrum and basically in what capacity. Uh, two, that all the survey data collected would be cataloged in the FCC's computer uh, assisted pre-coordinator resource database and that uh, that uh, database, uh, the data put in that base would uh, uh, be used by the uh, LA City and County Law Enforcement and Recovery Program to coordinate the use at any time by ground and aerial users of 4.9 gigahertz. 
uh, that pretty much covers uh, the first part. Like I said, we haven't actually deployed it in real-time scenarios yet, but we have used it to, in a training scenario that was quite effective, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Thank you, Lieutenant Wilkins. Um, going back to uh, slide 11, uh, the network diagram, um, uh -huh. what is the distance of some of the links that you have there? Uh, it's a very interesting uh, topology diagram that you have. Jesse? The distance of some of the, uh, the links that you show in the diagram? Yeah, sure. Hold on. Uh, they vary in distance between uh, 10 to 20 miles. Okay. And we're talking about the, uh, the, the mountaintops there where you see uh, right. uh, Oat Nike and uh, Mount McDill. Right, I don't okay. I you can see on the top of the slide. I don't know what you have up on there. I'm hoping it's – you have this slide 11, correct? Yeah. 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 Yeah, we're, we're pretty much looking at roughly uh, 20 miles. And, again, this, this was our layout for 2.4. Um, this will be our – this will be our general layout for 4.9. It may expand, and in fact, probably will once we uh, once we get a vendor on board and start uh, uh, designing our, our, our uh, uh, additional infrastructure. But uh, this is kind of just to give you a rough idea of how we used the 2.4 initially. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next question is related to applications, and I'm interested in. Um, the types of applications that are running over these networks that public safety is using. And um, I guess we can open it up to anybody, but I can start. We can go around in order, if uh, see if anybody wants to take this question. Um, Bill, you can. Good, uh, thank you. I was going to, going to expand on, on a little bit. I mentioned the uh, maybe the primary use would be to backhaul video cameras uh, up and down interstates and major highways uh, over 4.9 to replace least T1 lines. You may be interested in what kind of bandwidth or what, how much traffic we can, we can put over that. Uh, many of the manufacturers now in 4.9 on a 20 megahertz channel um, using uh, multiple input and multiple output can um, get 100 megabit per second um, bandwidth capability and scale that so that 80% is upstream, upstream, 20% downstream. Uh, using a, um, a state-of-the-art HD IP camera, uh, adjusting or selecting the, the bit rate, you can easily get uh, 20 to 30 high-definition streaming, uh, a high-definition camera streaming at uh, 25 to 30 frames per second, plus another 60 to 80 um, devices, roadside devices that don't take up as much bandwidth, such as the um, traffic counters, programmable, mes programmable message boards, and, and the weather devices, uh, and still have, on top of all that, about 50 percent reserve um, of bandwidth. So uh, the application that we see is just for to aggregate a lot of uh, arterial um, communications links, uh, and even on the 4.9, although 50 megahertz or 20 megahertz channel isn't a lot compared to a gigabyte type radio or millimeter wave radio, that's still uh, being able to to put together a, a bandwidth of 100 megabits per second, scale it to 80 upstream, 20 downstream, that's, that's a really phenomenal uh, capability considering any link would be under $5,000. So that's a really, really very cost effective application for us in the transportation area. That's great. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Steve? Uh, also, uh, and this is probably going to I would defer to Bill uh, more so, uh, I've gotten some inquiries from some transportation folks, specifically with some ITS applications, wanting to use some of the DSRC 5850 to 5925 and not being able to really find the hardware to do what it is they want in 5850 to 5925. So in turn, they've, they've applied 49 to some of those applications. So uh, I'm not certain as to uh, the status of, of, of the, on the hardware side for, for the DSRC, and I know that there's some next-gen 911 stuff that's out there, but I've had more than one uh, person approach me looking for ITS applications, the same kind as Bill uh, just spoke to, wanting to use some DSRC and, and not really finding the hardware capabilities available for that, so in turn they've gone to use 4.9. So mm -hmm. I don't know whether that's a, that's a hardware thing that, that's, uh, uh, that's still out there or not. This has been maybe within the last six or eight months. So. Okay. 
Uh, Mark, further comments on uh, applications that public safety are using on the networks? Sure. Well, I think we talked about uh, surveillance cameras, which is, is probably the one that uh, requires the most bandwidth, and, um, and it's why when we look, we certainly see places for 700 megahertz or cellular, but um, for the kind of video that most agencies want to pull, um, it, it, that, that's probably the biggest driver for using 4.9. Um, we also run gunshot detection, uh, license plate recognition, um, chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, uh, video analytics. Um, we will run call boxes uh, over that same wireless network, access control, and uh, automated meter reading. And um, why each one of those, um, and, and there's many others, um, but why each one of those is, is valuable in its own right, um, when you combine the information from them, it, they kind of become exponentially valuable. And, and one of the things um, every RMS does a lot is, is integrating those. And when you do that, you need to have all that information real time or the, or the integration kind of falls apart. So again, it goes back for the need for a lot of bandwidth. Um, I will say these, these wide area networks are one of the few times I think I've ever been able to make every department in an agency happy. Um, you know, if you look at public works where they can do automated meter reading and traffic control, you look at IT, they can run uh, voice and data. Public safety can run all the things we mentioned. Um, and you look at the, um, the, the politicians or the folks that are in charge of budgets, which today are obviously tight, um, and they say we can use the same highway to run all these different things. It, it's, it, it's really become a, a great point. Um, and I guess the only thing I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up with is we always kind of tease that you, um, you can run a, um, a car um, on an eight-lane highway, but you cannot run a tractor trailer on a Jeep trail. And, um, and we kind of encourage folks when they're designing these networks to look at what their maximum bandwidth uh, need is going to be and, and design around that, not, not vice versa. So thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, you mentioned automatic meter reading. Um, are they doing uh, video or data or um, drill down a little bit more on that? Um, so, so the meter reading is really just a way for a city or an agency to um, gain efficiencies by not having to have people go out to every meter. Um, so all that information comes back over, uh, it, it can come back over the same wireless network. Um, and, and that's why a lot of the manufacturers now are deploying radios that uh, work in many different frequencies. Um, but it's really a way to gain efficiency. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, Martin, any comments uh, on applications? Uh, sure. Well, if you just stick strictly to public safety, yep. uh, f initially, we, we're seeing video surveillance, obviously. Uh, we're seeing uh, voice uh, for, you know, vehicle to um, headquarters communications. Uh, we see data access of a variety of types, uh, r report generation, uh, downloading uh, diagrams at, at, of a building at, at an incident. So it, uh, we really see applications across the full uh, band. Uh, now, if you look at the network beyond just uh, the, the public safety, then uh, if it's municipal network, you can see other departments using it for things like um, uh, AMR that was already mentioned uh, for things like traffic control, traffic management, for things like um, uh, SCADA for, uh, for water pumping stations, uh, things of, of that sort, and also video surveillance of, you know, if, if you've got some water towers out there and you want to keep an eye on them, you, you can do video surveillance on that too. And for those situations in which uh, the network is being used simultaneously by a commercial service provider, then you're seeing all of the typical uh, uh, applications that you would see uh, on internet access, in, in including voice these days and um, uh, and and uh, and data transfer. Uh, I guess I should mention one more point while we're on this topic. Uh, when you're dealing with public safety, the question of security always comes up, and so uh, there has been an inclination to want to have your own separate network because <coughs> then you don't have anybody else. Uh, sort of launching into it. But if you have secure VLANs and if you have encrypted signals, then those things can be, take care of, be taken care of and you can operate across a common infrastructure. A and just as in Scott's case, if you have more bandwidth that's been allocated for, for other uses and you run into an emergency and you need to get it someplace, it's there. And so those facilities are available as well. Thanks. Very good comments.
Um, Scott, any uh, couple minutes of comments on uh, applications? Yeah, sure. I, you know, as I mentioned, the, the various applications it, it opened up uh, to our offices out in the field that we couldn't, due to bandwidth restrictions, have. Um, the other part that's really important is you're managing your own network. You're not, you're in charge of your own destiny. You you don't have to uh, deal with uh, a, a provider to uh, to help you out. You can go at your own pace, do your own thing. Um, and you know, what, like one of the quick things that we do, let's say the Boston Marathon, uh, I can set up a command post real quickly by just taking two laptops, uh, one of the uh, Strix radios, and a mag mount antenna, and uh, log bow and a five port uh, switch, tie those all together. I can log two laptops in, and uh, I can have access to my computer aided dispatch system, my record management system, two different uh, video camera systems as well as any uh, emergency management databases or the, uh, or, or the uh, policies that are, that'll dic dictate around the, the race, what's happening during particular points, uh, how we're gonna shift our manpower, et cetera. So all that's available. Um, when we started using this three years ago uh, and using the cameras and, and this whole spectrum, uh, it was like we're now doing the, the Boston Marathon that we've done for over 120 something years much differently now. Uh, because of the technology that we now have available to us. Thanks, Scott. Um, okay, I, I'm going to go to the last question before we um, go to the audience for some questions, and I'll ask Los Angeles to see if they want to answer this first. Um, this is related to incident response communications, so I'm wondering about the uh, use of the band um, for any type of emergency incident response um, a, a, as um, incident command centers. Um, so with that said, do we have Los Angeles on the phone and s first? Yeah, and see yeah Pat, I'm still here. Okay, um, great. And if you, if you want to go ahead and throw up a slide 20, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we haven't actually used it for any real life scenarios, but we did, uh, we did use it in an operation uh, back in 2008. Uh, operation uh, was a, a uh, simulated uh, 7.8 earthquake uh, drill called Operation Shakeout, and there were literally uh, over 100 uh, public safety agencies and, and millions of citizens within Southern California that participated in the drill. It was uh, the largest earthquake uh, preparedness activity uh, drill that we did uh, in U.S. history, and the epicenter of the earthquake was centered in Riverside County, which is about uh, 45, 50 miles east of Los Angeles, and it was uh, Essentially, it was a catastrophic earthquake r right along the San, As San Andreas Fault in the uh, in the LA Basin, and it lasted 90 seconds. And it you know created uh, extensive mutual aid from you know from local and state agencies, uh, required uh, uh, federal and uh, DoD responses. Um, if you if you switch to the next slide, uh, you can. This is kind of a uh, a quick map of uh, of. Uh, California there, and you can see where the uh, in the, the big red uh, mark there is where the where the earthquake uh, took place in the San Andreas Fault, and it, it literally, uh, if you look at the, the yellow bands there, uh, we received mutual aid throughout uh, that entire region right there, including the uh, the uh, the DoD. Um, if you go to slide 22, that will give you an idea of uh, the the zone. That red line is the San, San Andreas Fault, and all that area is affected. Uh, anytime you have a, a large, earth, you know, a large earthquake or a large activity on that on that uh, on that fault fault line there, uh, you can see it. It actually affects a a, a large, uh, a very large populated area. Go to the next slide, 23. <clears throat> Basically, the situation was that all all, all our uh, normal communications and infrastructures. Uh, were, were either uh, completely had completely failed or, or were, were overtaxed. Um, we had to uh, obtain uh, field disaster assessment information was uh, virtually non-existent. Uh, our normal modes of transportation were also non-existent. The uh, the highways were uh, com completely shut down. <coughs> Excuse me. Our uh, uh, and it was very difficult to obtain uh, uh, field intelligence. Uh, obviously, for you know, for obvious reasons, because communications were down, and and uh, and, there, and there's no way to 
uh, access uh, uh, most of the areas because the roads were down. That, the, that was a perfect concept or idea for us to deploy our, our crew team. Uh, what we did was used uh, uh, airships and 4x4 vehicles to transport our, our, uh, our crew team to, to various uh, uh, destinations that we had set up, pre-established. Uh, if you want to go to slide 24, excuse me, it talks about the mission of our crew team. And, and our first priority, obviously, was to establish communications and data at two disaster points that we, that we located. One was in Malibu and the other was in Lancaster, and that's probably uh, probably about 45 miles, I'd say. Right, Jesse? Yeah. Yeah, it's probably about 45 miles from Malibu to Lancaster. And uh, we used the, uh, the Harris 5800 high-frequency man pack and, and the Harris 1033M uh, radios, uh, along with the tactical chat software. We established our voice communications, data, uh, VoIP uh, phone, and uh, also live streaming video at, at multi-agency at a multi-agency staging area. Uh, the the, uh, the 5800 uh, <coughs> excuse me 5800 uh, uh, frequency man pack uh, tactical software and the Harris uh, RF uh, 7800 broadband uh, radio uh, was used on the 4.9 spectrum, and the distance from our uh, original staging area to the command post was 33 miles. Uh, Lieutenant Wilkins, if you could yeah. finish up in, the, in another minute, I appreciate it. We have the okay. some questions from the audience. Yeah, well, Thank we'll you. just uh, absolutely. We'll just basically um, let me see. Here. If you switch to go to slide 28, and you you can quickly see the uh, um, what we established. We had uh, uh, voice and data communications uh, between uh, the the between Malibu and Lancaster. Uh, back to our uh, and back to our base station, and we had uh, 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 broadband set up between uh, our base station and Claremont. So, essentially, what happened was uh, the, the equipment was uh, was uh, uh, worked very well. The 4.9 uh, worked very well. We used radios to uh, uh, coordinate with each other, you know, point to point, and then we used the uh, 4.9 equipment to. Um, uh, transmit uh, video and, and uh, data back and forth, and it was very successful. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to maybe just give Scott uh, maybe um, a minute or two. Um, you'd used um, an incident command center or something you mentioned in your presentation at, uh, I might be mistaken, at the Botham Marathon or something? Or? Right, I, I sort of jumped <laughs> in that when we were talking about the applications, but uh, yeah, that's how how simple it is for, for us to, to, to stand up and get that information out there. And uh, you're able to do this long before uh, a trailer shows up that you would traditionally be using uh, with all your communications device. Um, like I said, all, all I need is a, uh, a vehicle, um, the antenna, the uh, laptops, mm -hmm. the radio, and uh, it opens up all my databases. Um, like I said, the two video feeds uh, that are, are monitoring the, the marathon route that runs through Brookline, uh, as well uh, as monitoring the Boston cameras. We share our cameras during uh, that event. Um, and uh, again, basically the, the entire overall piece of managing the, the, the whole large scale events like that just, just totally change when you have this, this available to all the way down to the, to the user level out there. And everybody that's tied up on the marathon um, the other units that are out there are uh, able to see what other units are, are tied up through the CAD screen. Um, you know, if somebody's tied up, they know they've got to switch to another area. So it's all, you know, the visual piece comes into being a, a big play as opposed to trying to remember it all in your head where you can just glance at your laptop, see where your units are, um, and, and basically see what's going on out there. So it, to me, it's quite simple. If I can run an application on my la local LAN network, I can use 4.9 and I run it out in my vehicles. That's great. Sounds good. Okay, um, at this point, I think we'll open it up to questions uh, from the audience. Yeah, it looks like we have a speaker set up in the middle. Yeah. I just Steve? have a quick point that may, that may spur some discussion as well. One of the things that, that's been discussed, and I would defer to, to Mark and Martin could, could speak to this uh, as well, it, it seems like 
uh, the, the device market is kind of steered 4.9 towards access and, and, and some of the other, uh, the 5 gig products, 5.8 as Martin indicated, towards backhaul. And, and I wonder, and because I can tell you that when the rules were orig originally developed, this was kind of what we had in mind, and, and the devices really haven't spoken to that, was that at an access level, we certainly want public safety to utilize 4.9 when it's available. When it gets congested, we had a theory that, that, that the uh, opportunistically devices could be able to, when 4.9 was, uh, rather than scale down, uh, on a site-by-site -site basis to be able to borrow from the uniband and offer some of that depending on availability, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was one of the reasons why the emission mask battle went and we had all that. So I'm wondering, does that, and I would ask to Martin because he spoke to that, does that begin to hinder the backhaul uh, or your, your availability of access for backhaul in that opportunistic uh, uh, access beyond 4.9 if you start to allow 5.4 and 5.7 uh, parts of that. So that was originally the vision. The devices today really just limit 4.9 as access, and then the 5 gig is really kind of for backhaul. So uh, I'm wondering, is there the availability in a congested 4.9 <laughs> environment to borrow on an opportunistic basis uh, in the 5 gig market? <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Martin. Uh, sure. Um, the, uh, well, so first of all, the answer depends on, it's, it's, it's a vendor decision about how they design their product. The, w the way we designed ours, each node in the network has two 5 gig band radios, okay? And the, uh, each of them operate on a different frequency. The upstream one's on one frequency and the, and the downstream one's on another. And the, reason, uh, and the whole reason behind that is if you don't do that, then everybody starts <laughs> crashing into each other, the packets start colliding, a, 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 and you run into bandwidth restrictions. So, so we did that to maintain a maximum bandwidth capability. So um, a, a, the downstream radio in our system permits access from either the downstream node or from a downstream client. So if you have a handset that can switch uh, from uh, 4.9 to 5.8, uh, then uh, it'll log in just like any other subscriber. So, so with our system, the answer is yes. Now, um, uh, you know, there's about, uh, if you look at the 5.8 band, the 20 megahertz spectrum, uh, traditionally, there's 54 megabits over the air and about 20, meg 20 megabits of throughput. And so uh, you need to be cognizant of, of that. Now, with the 11N system, you know, you, you're looking at 100 to 150 megabits of throughput, and that's probably more than enough for everybody. So my answer is there should not be a problem. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the audience for a question. Hi, Pat. Um, I'm Harlan McEwen. Uh, I represent the International Association of Chiefs of Police. And uh, first of all, uh, a comment, and that is that uh, I'm really encouraged by uh, all of the uh, presentations and the, the increasing use of 4.9. Uh, there were a lot of us that uh, worked hard to uh, get the, that, uh, that resource, and uh, uh, the fact that it's being used uh, increasingly is very, uh, very good. Uh, Scott, uh, to you, I guess the, the question is, I mean, you, uh, Martin, you also mentioned the, the uh, future of the 700. A lot of us are now focused more on the 700 because of some of the, uh, the ongoing issues. Uh, it would be wonderful if um, ultimately uh, we had the capability of having 700 and 4.9 4 in, in a single device. We, we all understand that there are some limitations and, and uh, but we're we're hoping that the vision is is the right one uh, the question I guess to Scott is uh, you're limited basically to the vehicle you're not using any handheld devices or anything where you go into buildings because that's the the one reason we're promoting 700 is we need to get into the buildings and have building coverage is are you you just limited to the vehicles or wherever you put a Yes, that's, that's basically it, naturally. Um, you know, one of the interesting pieces we found uh, when we build out, we were starting to build out the network, is the, uh, um, the, the 2.4 and the 4.9, the propagation. We were seeing the propagation on 4.9 going well past 2.4, and that had a lot to do with the interference. I'm not the scientist up here. I can't really tell you, but I can tell you what I saw as far as interference in the 2.4 block and the, the 4.9 block being a, uh, a flat line. As far as 700, yeah, I... I I would like to see 700 for a 4.9 network would be used not to replace the 4.9 network, but to enhance it. Exactly. And, um, I, I, you know, I was 
I was hoping that uh, that uh, Boston, the uh, home, uh, Homeland Security region, was going to be able to get a waiver and build out 700. Part of our plan was to attach the uh, Brookline 4.9 to that. And um, but that that's a key point. Like you said, when you when you're traveling, not only in building but out of your your boundaries, out of your umbrella, uh, you're going to need that that 700 to keep some sort of connection going. Yeah, that's the big. I think Pat, that's the big uh, comment I would like to make is that uh, we need to you know, have both those resources because uh, we're never going to build out the whole nation using 4.9 for mobile applications. This is a great, uh, you know, some of the applications you're using here are wonderful, but there are limitations. Thank you. Uh, another comment? Okay, my, my comment is this. Um, uh, you're absolutely right that the two systems are complementary. So, so the next question is, um, are you going to have two complementary but independent systems? Or would you just as soon have it on a single system? That, if it was on a single system, it would simplify operations. At the moment, since the two systems work off, you know, different protocols, that ain't going to happen. But if, if somebody, and I'll, I'm looking at Pat, <laughs> had a mechanism for getting people to agree on a single standard, uh, it would be nice. Thank you. Uh, Mark, you were going to comment also? One, I'll, yeah, I'll second that. that. That would certainly be nice. But um, also for folks like ICP, I think what's really important is, is to educate your members about the need for both um, or a combined but not one or the other. And I, I'll throw out um, St. Paul for Republican National Convention. Um, not only were you pulling all that information and all that video, but you had about 400 users from 60 different agencies that it was being pushed to for situational awareness. Um, so clearly, the throughput, y you need something more than 700 megahertz, but how great would it be if they could have gotten that when they were in buildings, when they were in remote places that weren't where the 4.9 network was? So I, I think the key is really educating people on that they need, they need both of these technologies. Or Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Another question from the audience? Yeah. Well, uh, I was going to say this when I sat in the panel uh, later today, but maybe there's a point to be made here, and it's really a comment, not a question. Just think about a computer. You have three independent radios on it. It's going in. You have a Bluetooth radio. You have a Wi-Fi radio, and you have a cellular radio. And it's, imp it's totally transparent to the user because the software integrates it. So the real issue isn't the protocols. It's somebody to build the system that integrates the radios and make it, uh, it shall I say, transparent. Uh, to the officer in the field, and that's entirely doable. The question is, somebody has to think there's a market. And I know some folks are thinking about it, by the way. <laughs> Very good point. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the audience? I'm, I'm Bill Brown. I'm with the um, Ashdo, American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. I don't leave an open question. I guess Mark has uh, touched on it. Martin, you've touched on it. But it's on about interoperability and the sharing of the, of the video data you get. Do you share this video and data with other disciplines? So does it, does any, any okay, go ahead. Yeah, we, uh, I mean, we don't have the right to share it with anyone. It's not ours. We, we build the systems, but the agencies that we do um, definitely do. Actually, to go back to St. Paul, the system that we built that let all those people from all those agencies um, collaborate, uh, Hennepin County, the neighboring county, has now bought, they have 4,600 cameras coming back on the piece of software we wrote from different disparate systems. So what that software does is it, it A, lets all these different disparate video systems. So if Minnesota DOT has one and City of Bloomberg has a different kind and the county is a different kind, it lets them all come to a common platform. And then it lets all of the different agencies within the county have access to that video. Um, and, and that actually came about, um, we, we, we first started doing that for RNC because you had the cameras we put in, but you know, there was universities within St. Paul that had cameras, there was the state capitol building. Um, and, and it goes, it, it's kind of similar to the more ways you can use the wireless network, the cheaper it, it becomes. The more people that can use each camera, the less expensive that camera becomes a, as well. So yeah, we're seeing all over the country agencies mm -hmm. start to, uh, to share video, and, and um, we're actually seeing it between our private public as well. We, we have a city out west um, where the private agencies raised a great deal of money to have their video cameras available to public safety um, should they need them in case of emergency. Thanks, Mark. 
Very interesting and very good question from the audience. I think we have time for maybe uh, one more. Fred? Gene Flano, FCC. This is directed to uh, Mark because I heard him mention it. Mark, you, you talked about 4.9 and use for smart grid applications. Are there other applications for utility use, for example, that uh, load management, system network transmission management that this spectrum would be, uh, could be used for? Yeah, and um, w when I was talking about that, um, it, it was kind of wireless networks in general. But sure, um, if you look, there, there's all sorts of, of applications from traffic management um, to the, uh, the the AMI that we talked about that, that you'd want to uh, would want to have access to this if they could have it. Thank you. Um, well, I'd like to thank the panelists. Um, it's been a very good discussion, and I think we've uh, learned many successful ways that uh, public safety is using this 50 megahertz of spectrum. Um, so with that said, I think we'll take a short uh, five-minute uh, break while we set up for the second panel. Thank you. Okay, so welcome back for the second panel of today's 4.9 band gig uh, 4.9 gigahertz band workshop. I'm Jennifer Manor. I'm the I'm one of the deputy bureau chiefs for the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau and the dire acting director for the Emergency Response Interoperability Center. And the sa uh, uh, we're still in the morning. It feels like afternoon. The second panel today is focused on what can be done to increase <coughs> usage in the 4.9 gigahertz band. So this is really a, a complement to this morning's panel where we had the opportunity to hear from a lot of folks on what they're doing in the 4.9 gigahertz band and how it's being utilized. Um, so this second panel is really going to focus on what more can we do, um, especially from the commission perspective, to increase the use of the panel. So what we're going to do is um, I've asked the panelists to each introduce themselves um, and then we'll go back around and people will do their presentations and then we'll have some questions. Um, so the first person I wanted to introduce um, himself is Dave Buchanan who's joining us on the phone. So Dave, can you just give yourself a brief introduction please? Sure, be glad to. Um, I'm Dave Buchanan. I am chair of the NIPSTIC uh, Spectrum Committee. I, uh, my background is I'm, <coughs> excuse me, I'm uh, retired from the county of San Bernardino, about 32 years with the county, and I uh, manage, did management and engineering on their uh, public safety uh, radio systems, uh, amongst other things, and uh, been working with uh, NIPSTIC and, uh, for a number of years, and I'm a life member of APCO. So. And uh, also I should mention that uh, along with Steve Devine and some others, uh, I worked originally uh, on the comments for uh, setting up the rules on the 4.9 uh, gigahertz band. So I have a kind of a background from the very beginning on this band. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Um, Brett? I'm Brett Colborn. I'm an attorney with the Utilities Telecom Council, which is UTC. Uh, some of you all might recognize it, um, although uh, we haven't had as much experience in the public safety community as we probably will be in the future. Uh, UTC is a trade association for the utilities, telecom, and IT interests. Uh, we've been around since 1948. Uh, utilities have been operating private internal systems even before that, and basically we got our start because utility companies don't know a whole lot about compliance and communications, uh, so we were brought in as the FCC experts and we help them out with compliance on issues like that. Um, and so we're also looking at the 4.9 band, uh, very interested in this from a couple of different standpoints, emergency response, of course, but also smart grid. I'm Nancy Merritt. I'm with the National Institute of Justice. We're a component of the U.S. Department of Justice. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit today um, in my presentation about how we fit into this um, area. I'm a social scientist, so I differ from a lot of you, but we're trying to um, bridge the gap between social science and technology in the work that we're doing, and I'll tell you more about that later. 
Good morning. My name is Pam Montaneri. I'm the Pinellas County Radio and Data Systems Manager. Um, I also serve as a Vice Chair for Interoperability for NIPSTIC, and I'm our Regional Coordinator for the Tampa Bay Region for All Interoperability. Uh, I've worked for Pinellas County for over 22 years, and uh, Pinellas County has tested a lot of these technologies, 4.9, along with the 700 megahertz band over the past several years. So we have a lot of experience in testing the technologies um, prior to deployment. Hi, I'm Joe Ross with Televate. <laughs> I've been at Public Safety Broadband since 2002. Um, I was one of the main instigators in promoting 700 megahertz broadband early on. Um, I have uh, managed several large-scale deployments uh, for broadband for public safety um, and evaluated extensively 4.9 gigahertz. I'm also the chair of the Assessment of Future Spectrum and Technologies Working Group for NIFSTIC. Uh, good morning. My name is Ed Thomas, and I'm presently a partner in Wilshire Granis. Uh, before that, I actually was a chief engineer here at the FCC and the 4.9 proceeding uh, started when I was here. Uh, prior to that, I was CTO of uh, Bell Atlantic before, before it became Verizon, and I've been a CEO of MM Radio Link, a manufacturer of very high-frequency radios, and also of RSL, which was an international carrier. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Um, and just to build on, actually, what Ed said, um, I had the opportunity when I was last at the Commission um, to work on the 4.9 gigahertz band proceeding when the initial rules were started. Um, so this is an area of vast interest to me, which is part of why I think this panel is of critical importance. I think it's very important. Um, this was foreseen as a band with great potential um, and one that I think the Commission would very much like to see um, increased in utilization. So that's, that's really the point of the second panel. So with that, um, Dave, would you be willing to start the presentations? Yeah, I'd be happy to. If you'd like to put up the uh, slides, I'll get started. Okay, they're up, Dave. I don't think you. I don't know if you can see. <laughs> yeah, a little delay there, but I see it. Um, yeah, I just want to go ahead to the second slide. Um, Nipstick uh, just recently, a matter of fact, this week we closed it out real quick to get this ready. Uh, conducted a survey on the usage of 4.9 gigahertz band to get a better handle just on how it's being used and, and what's going on in the band because obviously everybody's heard a lot of stories about how it's used and uh, fragmented uh, information, but we really didn't have a good handle and we thought a survey might help uh, clarify things. So that's what we conducted. We've um, asked some key questions. Um, is your agency currently using the 4.9 spectrum? Are you using the 4.9 spectrum uh, to indicate the primary, and if so, indicate the primary use of the spectrum? What 4.9 spectrum uses have you found successful? Uh, and then also the opposite, what ones have been unsuccessful? And what would you consider using in the future with the band? And we also asked how the, if you use the band for incident management to get a handle on that. Uh, next slide. Um, if you're, is your agency using the spectrum? Um, it was a mixed bag here. Uh, we had a quite a few uh, no responses on that, but uh, most of the folks here that answered uh, are using it. Um, some of the responses came from consultants and others in the field that aren't direct users, so uh, that just gives us kind of a flavor of, of who the responders are. Uh, next slide. Uh, this one's an interesting one, um, the primary use of the band. Point-to-point -point was clearly the biggest uh, use of the band, and you'll notice on the slide out to the uh, right, there's some uh, other percentage numbers that aren't labeled. Um, this slide uh, included a lot of no responses, so I tried to, to uh, factor those out. And if you go with those percentages, 56% um, used it for point-to-point, 
twelve percent for point to multi point that would be wi fi hotspot that type of thing mesh networks and then point to point video connections uh, which is just another flavor of point to point was another nine percent and, uh, and then we had a percentage of the people that got on but didn't didn't know how they were using it <coughs> maybe they just had the license and didn't start up that was about twenty three percent but from that you can see one of the largest uses is point to point as opposed to the point to multi point um, successful uses uh, this was a uh, text-based uh, answers so I tried to pull out some representative ones and present them here um, the utilization of spectrum has been successful for both point-to-point -point and point-to-multipoint applications the primary concern is users who are not licensed especially in point-to-point -point operations um, then access to in-building video cameras mesh networking for public safety broadband so obviously and that ties in with the this morning's panel where we heard that there there is a video mesh the point to point we have been uh, successful in the use of 4.9 providing wireless applications supporting both surveillance video and backhaul op applications it's been de uh, deployed in both point to point and point to multi point scenarios uh, and then the last one is just currently using to link radio sites to a m as a microwave link. So that's another usage. Um, although it's secondary, it, it is. We had to, a few comments that, and I know personally of people that are, are using it to to backhaul, particularly in rural areas um, where it's hard to get other uh, backhaul part 101 uh, licenses or the pass may be difficult uh, to get back your radio system linked in uh, to the rest of your system even though it's uh, not broadband it's still an important application um, next slide uh, this would be the unsuccessful uses um, point to multipoint is not a realistic configuration due to the number of sites required for deployment and the lack of coordination of the frequencies and the susceptibility for interference interference in high traffic areas uh, is another comment as the number of users congregate in one area i.e. working fire bandwidth decreases significantly to where streaming video is no longer viable Streaming video while moving is choppy and pauses a lot. Uh, use of use for data systems outside of urban environment it seems to work okay in the city, but not in the rural areas with vegetation or rolling hills. And then we had one comment that all all implementations have been successful. Uh, next slide. Future use. Um, Again, point-to-point uh, -point, uh, seems to be uh, the biggest user. These, uh, and I might mention these uh, percentages don't add up because you could uh, uh, select more than one application for the future use. So uh, pretty much uh, go with the number of responses is probably a better way to look at this one. But point-to-point -point video, point-to-point -point ground-based broadband IP, uh, point to point, uh, po point to multi point is also uh, popular, and and people are looking at it for the future. Point to point airborne um, IP data and point to point airborne video are is um, had several people respond that they'd be interested in that, and that's interesting in that the rules don't currently allow that um, as uh, uh, Lieutenant Wilkins mentioned in this morning's panel they they are using it but they uh, received a waiver to do uh, airborne video in the LA area so might be something to uh, take a look at whether that restriction needs to be there or not uh, next slide eight uh, this would be um, incident management have you used 4.9 spectrum for incident management communications at the scene? 
Um, it's interesting that, as you can see, uh, if you factor out the uh, uh, no responses, that very few people have, have used um, has used, actually used it for incident management. Uh, most have not, and I think that's reflected probably in in the usage of the band uh, being at uh, mainly point to point applications. Uh, is indicated by this survey, and I think the other thing is is that uh, is that one remark on the earlier slide. Um, sometimes it's just hard to to get the systems up. I know we heard uh, when I was listening to this morning that other people have been successful at it, but uh, but the lack of coordination and maybe not knowing whether the system's going to be available and whether and you got different agencies coming in, all trying to put up systems. I think that causes some issues. Um, that's just speculation, but uh, it seems to be the only things I can think of for this type of an answer. Uh, next slide. I just uh, uh, this is the last slide. Also, I'd just like to throw out a couple recommendations. I, I labeled them personal only because the second one. I haven't vetted through the NIPSTIC process. The, the first one is, is consistent with what uh, NIPSTIC uh, commented to the commission in uh, the docket 07100, and that's to change the rules to better coordinate the uses in a given area. I mean, we need to recognize that this band is used for both point to point and point to multi point in the same area, and will require procedures that accommodate both users. I think an important thing, too, that we pointed out is that the, ex the RPCs, the regional planning committees, have a lot of expertise in coordination and, and um, getting people together and, and actually working out how to best manage the band, and I think we need to tap into that in the rules. Um, and they, they've indicated to us back when we... Uh, surveyed them that, that they were willing to take this on. Uh, NARPAC, their, their national uh, membership, is, is willing to help out. So I, I think that's uh, something that really ought to be taken a look at. We urged it originally that there needed to be tighter coordination. And I think what we found and what I found locally is I'm also the chair of the uh, Southern California Region 5 uh, 700 megahertz planning committee, when we got folks together to talk about this, uh, the main problem in deploying this band has been that we just don't know where all it's used, how it's used. Um, people just, there's there's no mechanism to for people to be forced to coordinate it, and therefore they just, they they don't. They just put it up or use it, or they get the license and decide that, oh, it's got interference, so I can't use it, whereas they probably could if we had a better coordination mechanism. And, and I might mention that CAPRAD, which is the database that the RPCs use, have a module built into it that will capture the data uh, geographically of, of how the uh, systems are used and that can be used as a real good tool. I think the second idea that I'd like to throw out is, is that since point-to-point -point is a um, big usage in the band, I think a valuable usage and probably even more valuable um, going forward, um, that we need to take another look at how to better um, use that uh, application with less interference to other people. And when I went back to looking at my experience with uh, designing microwave systems, uh, it's clear that one way to do that is, is rather than limit the antenna size to, to uh, limit the ERP, which just increases your beam width, um, to give you an example, the, the maximum gain in the rules right now is specified as 26 dB, and that equates to approximately an 8 to 10 degree band, beam width of the antenna, whereas if you had um, 
and you can go down as much as a, a nine or as little as a nine dB gain. I think it was in the rules. That's a very wide beam width, and that's just going to cause more interference. So I think we can take a look at at changing that around to to set a maximum ERP and a minimum antenna gain to reduce the beam width. Um, I was also mentioned. I think it's a good idea uh, this morning um, that use of horizontal polarization, so using different polarizations would help also, and that's another area where the RPCs could really um, help out. Um, the FCC and, and the 07100 proposed using the Part 101 procedures for prior coordination. Uh, we just don't feel that's going to work. It doesn't fit with the point to multipoint. There's the standards that they use for Part 101 are not um, just don't work for point to multi point, so we think uh, this is the better approach and would help. So um, that's all I have. Um, so I'll turn it back to you, Jennifer. Thanks so much, Dave. And with that, I was going to pass the pass the PowerPoint. I don't know what it is, laser, on to Brett. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. I'll wait for my presentation to come up. Uh, first of all, I, I do want to thank Jennifer and the rest of the bureau for giving us this opportunity to speak on this issue today. Um, as I said, we're, we've been sort of on the outside looking in, so I appreciate the opportunity for us to get our, our message out. Um, two main points I want to hit, uh, so this will be a brief presentation. Um, the main thing is eligibility for us, utility companies getting access to the spectrum. But that's, that's the initial <laughs> gating factor. Uh, beyond that, I want to try and talk a little bit about uh, fixed use antenna. But before I get to any of that, uh, I want to talk a little bit about UTC, just so everyone understands a little context of where we're coming from. Um, we're the trade association for the telecom and IT interests of the utility industry uh, and other critical infrastructure industries. Um, our members include all types of utilities and critical infrastructure industries. And so just so you know, uh, utilities uh, come in all shapes and sizes. We've got investor-owned utility companies, cooperatively organized utilities and municipal utility companies. And so, um, give you a little bit more, more to the point sort of background. Uh, I, I did have the opportunity to do a little bit of a review of the FCC's databases in terms of the 4.9 band. Um, all the licensees uh, of the 2100 plus uh, that are on the database, uh, only about 16 are truly uh, as far as I could tell from the licensee's name, truly utility companies, uh, and they're all munis. Uh, so that gives you an indication of where I'm coming from. I, I want to see you know, the potential for more utility company use of the spectrum and wider use of the spectrum in general. Uh, so when the, when the 4.9 band was being allocated and, and the rules were being implemented, we did have an interest in this. Um, we did file comments, and we did focus on the two issues that, were, that I'm going to talk about today, which is eligibility and fixed operations. So uh, the way the rules read currently, uh, they limit eligibility to uh, public safety services as defined under the 90.523 of the FCC rules. Um, so you know, the, those rules provide that you know, the principal purpose has to be to protect life, uh, health, and property. Uh, furthermore, you have to either be a governmental or non-governmental organization. Uh, if you're a non-governmental organization, you have to have the endorsement of a uh, traditional public safety entity that you know, has given you an authorization. Uh, and furthermore, that uh, communication system can't be used for uh, commercial purposes. So uh, that's the, the first hurdle. Um, when the FCC implemented the rules and the report in order, uh, I think it, and, and this is something for you all to file away for future reference as we, as we talk further in the Q&A, there were three main reasons why they said that um, they should limit access for, to traditional public safety folks. Uh, one was that even though they recognized that you know, 4 volume band had great potential for frequency reuse because of the propagation characteristics of the band, uh, they were primarily concerned about congestion. Um, uh, interestingly enough, uh, the utility companies did file. It wasn't just UTC. and. Uh, that actually raised more concerns than helped. Uh, so the, the SEC was actually concerned that the utility companies might, uh, you know, just deplete the, all the available capacity that would be out in the band. And then finally, um, the SEC said that it wasn't quite certain that there was technology out there that would permit public safety to be able to have priority access in the band. 
So like I said, file that away for future reference because it's all going to be very relevant for today's discussion and discussions into the future. Uh, next uh, requirement as part of the eligibility is that if a non-governmental organization gets access on a secondary basis, uh, subsection 1203B basically says that it's conditional. So if a public safety licensee withdraws its support, its authorization, the license immediately terminates. So uh, picture yourself as a utility company. Uh, obviously, that puts you in a position of risk. So um, I've highlighted in red what our ask is. You know, we think that clarifying the utilities and CII uh, that are eligible would uh, promote the use of the band. That's recommendation number one. All right, turning now to fixed services, um, I think the commission really got it right when it started out. They wanted to try and make this as flexible a, a, a band as possible. Um, but when it came to fixed operations, uh, they were only really on a primary basis allowed hotspot communications and temporary fixed. So you can't operate uh, point to point for more than a year on a primary basis. Um, the FCC came back and revised the rules. Originally, they were much more restrictive in terms of fixed operations, and to their credit, they tried to expand use of point-to-point uh, -point type communications. Um, but in so doing, they came up with a rule that um, I think inadvertently actually restricts use of the band, because you, you can only use it on a point-to-point -point basis for primary communications if the if the point-to-point -point communications are being used to link either mobile or broadband communications. And so, again, going back to what I was saying before, utility companies are looking at using this for a variety of different applications, some emergency response, um, some uh, smart grid. And so your final link uh, may not be a broadband link. There may be, for example, AMR, as was described in the previous panel. Uh, and you know, some of those communications are very narrow band in nature. So as a practical matter, this rule will prevent that kind of application. And I, I can't really think of a good reason from a technical standpoint why you would want to have that kind of restriction in there. I can understand from a policy standpoint, but I don't understand from a technical standpoint. So uh, I welcome any input on that as we go forward. So <clears throat> you know, my, my recommendation as far as that goes is that I think that the SEC uh, probably should expand that even further to permit all kinds of fixed point-to-point -point and multi-point type of operations. And that is the end of my presentation. Nancy? Thank you. Thank you. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, my presentation will be coming from a different perspective than most of the panelists and probably from most of the audience. It's going to be less technical. And what I wanted to talk to you about is how NIJ, my organization, hopes to help with the implementation of 4.9 and other technologies in the public safety area. First, what I'd like to do is just give you an overview of NIJ, who we are and what we do, and then talk to you about what we hope we can do in this field, what we can do in terms of improving the implementation and use of new technologies in public safety. We are um, not a real well-known part of the Department of Justice, but I think we're an important part. Um, we're within the Office of Justice Programs. We deal, unlike the rest of the Department of Justice, with state and locals and tribals. So we don't work with the federal um, government as much in terms of assisting them. We interact with them, but we generally assist the state and locals. We uh, have two science, uh, two research arms of NIJ. Historically, we've worked separately. There's the science and technology arm, which you all are probably most familiar with. That's where we actually test technology. Does something work? We have the other side, though, which is where I'm from, and that's the social science side. <coughs> Historically, what we've done is looked at programs and policies in the field. How does it affect outcome for prisons, for law enforcement, uh, for various types of public safety? What we're trying to do now is join those two, take the expertise from each, and try to establish a rigorous way of looking at the implementation of technology so we get a better sense of how it actually works in the field. So our purpose primarily is to answer the so what question. 
asking, okay, so we've put something in the field. What does that do in terms of operation and outcome? Does it really make the uh, field officer, the organization more effective or not? And to do that, what we're trying to do is get away from the idea of just listening to anecdotal evidence and actually gaining, gathering data and actually doing analysis so we can determine what situations dif different technologies work in and what technologies, uh, what situations they don't work in so we can better implement the process. Ideally, what we'll do when we gather this information is then develop a database where we can disseminate. That's one of the um, goals of NIJ, is not just to gather information, but importantly, to get it back out to the field. So what we're trying to do is establish a process, a model for evaluating implementation, and then also to put that model into place and do actual evaluations and share that information with the field. Um, what we found is that there are generally, within public safety, two types of uh, implementation of technology. One, the transfer of technology, where one takes technology that's been developed for, say, uh, Department of Defense and brings it down to fit the uh, public safety needs. We've worked with DHS and DOD in that area, and we're trying to expand it. We also want to look at the development of new technologies. For instance, not just taking what's there and trying to make it fit public safety, but saying what are the gaps in what we already have and how can we develop new technologies that specifically meet those needs. We're working with, um, as I said before, state and locals, but we also work with other federal agencies to learn from what they're doing. So we're working with the Department of Defense, we're working with FCC, um, with the Bureau of Prisons, to see what kind of technologies are effective out there and what the needs are. One uh, partnership that we're just starting is with um, Brookline, Massachusetts. Uh, Scott Wilder was speaking earlier this morning and um, they have very graciously agreed to work with us so that we can do an in-depth look at the implementation of a 4.9 system. The information that was provided earlier um, from NIPSTIC I thought was very interesting because that gave us a broad view of what's working and what's not as it's newly being implemented. This will give us a deeper view, a case study of how this was actually implemented and what some of the hurdles were, what were some of the surprises when it was being implemented, what were the regulatory problems, what were some of the successes. And so what we want to do is take an in-depth look at that and then again, disseminate that out to the field in terms of reports and getting that knowledge out to others who will be adopting systems in the future. So they'll know what questions to ask before they start putting systems in place. The impact, we hope, is that it will give us insight into what technology transfers easily, what some of the problems are, um, how we can develop uniform standards. We also want to help the field know what questions to ask when they're considering technology, to ask a vendor, so they don't go out there accepting whatever is given to them, that they go out as educated consumers. And then, as I've said before, we always want to make sure that we get this back out to the field. So what I'm asking of you all um, is that you let us know if there's any um, if there's any startups that you're starting, if you have any questions, if as, an, as a jurisdiction you have questions about how do I do this, um, where do I go, where do I get information, we would like to assist in that process and uh, put different people together, different knowledge bases together and share that information. So if you have any questions about this, if you want to get referrals, please contact us and we will try to assist in that process as much as we can. And in turn, we're hopeful that we can share what we learn with the field and get that information out to you. Thank you, Nancy. I, I think that the NIJ program is a very important program in terms of helping increase the use because it helps to educate folks on technology choices and other choices. So we look forward to continuing to work with you as well. And with that, Pam, Pam Montaneri from Pinellas County. Um, Pinellas County was one of the early adopters of 
4.9 gigahertz. We did a lot of letter writing from the uh, 24 municipalities within Pinellas County. We felt that this spectrum would be of great value to us. We also had the opportunity to test this technology as we move forward. Uh, we had a collaboration with RDEC, which is a U.S. Army um, Armament and Research Development Center, and we tested this technology in several different ways. When we first started into the test, our vision was to really try and pair the 4.9 with the 5.9 spectrum and be able to use it to provide information and situa situational awareness back to our dispatch centers locally or to the local law enforcement. However, as we progressed into this test, we found that that, really, that test really wasn't going to work out well for us. There wasn't a lot of equipment out there. Uh, we couldn't get the partnerships developed that we needed to develop. So we broke up our, our test into three different sections. And the first one was like an ad hoc type system. And ad hoc systems work great. However, one of the, our biggest lessons learned from that ad hoc system is you just can't roll up on scene and expect to start communicating with everybody. Um, it takes a lot of pre-configuration and there's a cost associated with that because you have to have the 4.9 attached to every laptop that's out there. And if you're already running several other technologies, it, it becomes pretty cost prohibitive to do this. The other one was the um, fixed type network. And we used um, some off-the-shelf type technology. We didn't go with any one particular vendor. And this technology actually worked extremely well. And we, we had pretty good throughput on, on those particular systems. Uh, we found after being up on the towers for a while, though, the, the system started to fail and they weren't as reliable. So we had to do a lot of tower climbs to keep that equipment operational. So that became um, a burden to us as well. The best use that we probably found out of the whole test was the streaming video from the traffic cameras that we could put directly into the law enforcement agency's hands. And, and that we have, still have some of those that we um, have operational today. We did do some um, operational tests with the uh, federal agencies and some department Department of Defense agencies, and those tests worked really well using IP-based phones and connectivity in a small area. But what we found is there really needed to be some changes to the spectrum because the way this, the um, spectrum is licensed and there's no co coordination and with the changes in technology, there was no way to re determine really who had the technology and who had it operational. As technology continues to emerge, there's a significant need um, <coughs> to have the backhaul systems, and, and we feel that either backhaul or point-to-point -point are probably two of the key issues that we could use going forward with this. Um, the coordination factors are also an issue. Um, we have 24 municipalities in Pinellas County, and I cannot tell you um, who has this deployed other than the county agencies that have it deployed because there's no um, requirements for tracking. So I would recommend tracking this more um, on a regional basis like we do our 700 and our 800 megahertz. If we get into the deployment costs, we really start talking about what type of system you want. Uh, one of the initial thoughts that we had in Pinellas County was to develop to develop a mesh type system using the 4.9 gigahertz, of course, anytime you have um, a spectrum that's dedicated directly to, directly to public safety, you run into the issues of cost. And so to deploy it in uh, Pinellas County, which is about 280 square miles, uh, was going to cost us about um, you know, $10 million just to deploy a system that we weren't even sure was going to meet the needs of the users in the field. So. Depending on what you do, and like I said before, when we tested in the ad hoc type environment, that added another $500 per laptop just to deploy the card in the system. Uh, the lower costs were in the fixed point to point and also the streaming video from the cameras. Uh, it depends on how you're going to use the technology, but I would recommend that as we move forward that we look at um, partnering this technology, and I think Harlan mentioned that earlier, with other technologies to see if we can improve the use through the, that partnership, uh, combining different types of technology. And then also, um, if the licensing capabilities are expanded to utilities, possibly partnering with them. They own a lot of um, 
real estate. They have a lot of poles already up in the air, and it might be able to save uh, a lot of costs for public safety. Uh, of course, all of us are looking at 700 megahertz broadband. We did the early greenhouse test in Pinellas County and have been looking at broadband for a long time. One of the uses that I feel um, for 4.9 in conjunction with 700 megahertz broadband it would be a backhaul type situation. Uh, the throughput's going to be significantly higher than what we have now, and so we're going to need a significantly wider data pipe to push that information through and to allow aggregation of channels in the 4.9 spectrum would actually increase the capabilities for that in conjunction with 700 megahertz. Since public safety had been allocated the spectrum, um, you know, there's been really been limited use, especially when within Pinellas County and the Tampa Bay region, and there's certainly a need for it. Uh, we have a lot of regional events. We have uh, the RNC coming in 2012, and there's a potential um, for the requirement for a lot of additional communications resources during that time. <coughs> so by allowing different types of deployment, um, I would like the FCC to consider uh, addressing different types of licensing, uh, the ad hoc licensing, fixed licensing um, on a permanent scale, and then working on the standards. Um, there's not a lot of equipment out there. There's a lot of proprietary equipment out there, but there's not a lot of open systems in 4.9 gigahertz where you can just put it up like you could the 2.4 gigahertz, which really doesn't meet the public safety requirements. So trying to develop standards, um, that's more of a manufacturer request as opposed to an FCC request. And then the ability to provide the fixed links, that was a big benefit um, to public safety to have a more permanent deployed fixed link. Uh, but we need to continue to modify the rules to address the needs of public safety. And there's a lot of emerging technology where we can utilize the spectrum in conjunction with the other spectrum. And I think providing flexibility in use but requiring coordination will really expand <coughs> the use of the 4.9 gigahertz going forward. Well, first, thank you, Jennifer, for inviting me here to speak on this uh, subject. Um, I don't want to beat on a dead horse, but I will. Um, uh, as Pam alluded, uh, as Pam mentioned, and as Dave alluded to, um, there is a coordination challenge at 4.9 gigahertz. Um, despite FCC rules, um, there are a lot of uncoordinated, uncoordinated activities. Um, we have customers that uh, were the only licensee for 4.9 gigahertz in their area, and found the spectrum to be completely congested for a major event that they intended to use it for. Um, so I think that uh, <clears throat> I think that's one of the major challenges of 4.9 gigahertz. Another challenge is that when you saw in Dave uh, Buchanan's slides that there is a desire for both fixed, mobile, temporary, permanent applications. And when you marry all these together, they become extremely complex to manage from an inter interference perspective. And so that there are risks, there are challenges for public safety licensees to be able to manage all these different applications, all these different uses. Um, third, uh, despite the large amount of spectrum, it, it still is a limited resource. Um, when you mesh um, access points together, you do lose some throughput, so there is some throughput loss at the incident. Um, one thing that needs to be known is as you, for, you increase the distance between the access point and the client, the throughput goes down. So if you have to go through a longer distance, more walls, your throughput is going to continue to de degrade. So despite the amount of spectrum, there is still a limited amount of throughput available. And then when you combine the fact that these, um, these multiple uses, you've got point-to-point -point video, you've got point-to-multipoint uh, mobile meshes, um, you, you need to be able to manage the interference between all of them. And when you manage the interference between them, you often do it by frequency, further dividing the spectrum and further reducing your available throughput. Um, <clears throat> importantly, reliability could also hamper 4.9 gigahertz. Obviously, the propagation character characteristics are not as good as lower spectrum allocations. Um, but in public safety, um, yesterday's failure is today's trash. 
So it has to be reliable, and public safety has to be able to rely on whatever solution that exists. So um, in my opinion, one of the primary and best uses of 4.9 gigahertz is where it can be pre-planned so that the engineers can make sure that it's got the appropriate reliability. It becomes less successful when you can't plan it in advance and you're not sure if you can have connectivity wherever you need it. And then, as I, you know, as I alluded to earlier, interference resulting from uncoordinated uses presents risks. As I mentioned, um, we have customers that have been scared away from use of the band as a result of the uh, interference that they've seen. So how can 700 megahertz and 4.9 gigahertz coexist? Um, one of the ways that I believe that they can coexist is in peer-to-peer in -peer communications. At 700 megahertz, uh, LTE will use the entire band. There's no more spectrum to do peer-to-peer -peer communications. That means it's a great opportunity for 4.9 gigahertz to step up and provide that kind of capability that public safety has in land mobile radio. Um, technologies at 4.9 gigahertz will support direct mode communications, um, and they will also support meshing, so you can daisy chain communications along the way to get from point A to point B. And they can also offload traffic from LTE. But uh, 4.9 gigahertz con connectivity is severely limited in buildings. So, you know, what can you rely on? Maybe 100 feet um, going through several walls. Um, it requires many devices at the incident scene in order to uh, support the communication. So getting from inside the building out to the incident commander is going to take multiple hops. Um, again, reducing your throughput. Um, is the solution to that that you have a hockey puck that you, that you drop, that the firefighters and the police officers drop along the way? I'll let the firefighters and police officers answer that question. I think they have enough to do to not to have to do that kind of thing. Um, which would mean that the devices would have to be separated. The devices that the firefighters and the police officers would hold would have to be spaced at less than 100 feet intervals. Um, again, presenting what I mentioned before, reliability risks. Um, and then, of course, in order to support an environment in where we have multiple jurisdictions uh, um, at an incident, we need a standard, right? We need standards, plural. Um, so a firefighter from Agency A can communicate and mesh with a firefighter from Agency B and share information. And then importantly, a lot of the applications that public safety uses today are client-server. So the CADs are client-server, a lot of the video systems are client-server, et cetera. So in order to be able to accommodate um, a 4.9 incident mesh, you either need to arrive on the scene with all the applications or the applications need to be able to accommodate this peer-to-peer -peer mode, again requiring standardization and for, for public safety to unify around a set of standards. Um, I also want to talk about uh, LTE, uh, backhaul for LTE 700 megahertz. Um, a, an LTE ring, um, microwave ring, um, supporting the, the capacity of a 10 megahertz allocation of, of, the, of 700 megahertz would require 150 megabits per second. If we got the D block, that's 300 megabits per second. So I don't know, and the vendors can correct me, I don't know what happened there, um, but I don't know of any um, uh, 4.9 gigahertz solution that can accommodate that kind of throughput and be able to have the frequency reuse to have multiple links connecting all of the sites up in a ring. Um, and the ring architecture is, is key for public safety. We love redundancy. You know, you can't spell public safety without redundancy. Um, 4.9 gigahertz can accommodate a few sites and can be especially effective for uh, site on wheels, cow on, uh, cell on wheels. Um, and it can produce, uh, c it can be leveraged whenever you run out of other spectrum. So if you don't have 6 gig, 11 gig, 18 gig spectrum for, um, for as your primary solution for backhaul, then 4.9 gigahertz may um, play an important vital role uh, to, to fill the gaps. And of course, wherever you can't get other spectrum allocations, you can't make the link, then it could be a spur off of a, a public safety system. Um, and uh, I think that, can, yes. That, so what, what can the FCC do? Um, I mean, one of the things uh, I was encouraged by uh, the discussion this morning, I think one of the things the FCC can do is to advertise um, what's, what's been done well, what's been effective, um, get, that, get that information out. Um, I think that 
you know, based upon this lack of coordination, I think um, the FCC could develop 4.9 gigahertz planning guidelines for regions, um, how to manage all of these mixed uses, temporary, permanent, fixed, mobile, point-to-point, non-point-to-multipoint, -point, point um, and provide guidance on frequency plans. Ha if you want to have all these mixed uses, what things can coexist together, what things can't, um, and how to, how to you know, provide some guidance to the, to the already overburdened regions that are managing a lot of spectrum today into um, uh, providing a, a very robust plan that manages this interference. The promise of 4.9 gigahertz is communication without fear of interference, and that's not happening. Um, provide more education to the vendor and public safety community regarding licensing and coordination. I've heard stories where the, the person selling 4.9 gear told the, the recipient of the, of the equipment that he didn't need to be licensed because he's public safety. He just gets, he gets to use the spectrum. Um, and that went to, to federal agencies as well. Um, emphasize that all uses must be coordinated and provide a recourse mechanism for uncoord uncoordinated uses. How, do you, how can you quickly uh, adjudicate whatever interference issue or use of the band that you know is supposed to be yours? How do you quickly find out how to, how to uh, turn that other use down that's not part of your regional plan? Um, require vendor pro marking on the product. So I don't know why people think that they don't have to be licensed and they don't have to coordinate, but they don't. So who's, you know, there's product going out there that's, that's, that's radiating on the spectrum. It, you know, perhaps the right answer is mark the product and tell people that they have to be licensed and they have to coordinate. Um, make it easier to coordinate. So perhaps a soft online application that um, evaluates interference, that manages all the different types of use. Um, that, so one place uh, shop for public safety to go to to uh, address all these different uses. Um, and then provide continued flexibility for all, uh, for all the spectrum bands and for all the, uh, the uses in the regions and let the regions decide what's the best use of their spectrum. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks so much. Ed? Uh, thank you, <coughs> thank you, Jennifer, for, for inviting me. I'm gonna, since I'm the last guy after a lo long day, I'm going to try to be very brief and try to get the juices flowing a bit with some radical ideas. I hope none of the public safety folks that are in the room came armed. <laughs> but, but, but as I mentioned before, uh, w this proceeding started when I was chief engineer uh, at the FCC. I'm delighted to see it start uh, to be used in various venues, but I'm also very disappointed because it in no way has taken off the way we had predicted five years ago or six years ago, whenever it was. And I really think that's due to two major causes. One of them is cost, and the other is it doesn't propagate that well. So you need more infrastructure, which then comes back to cost. So the question, and this is the only thing I'm going to talk about today, and I apologize if it's an oversimplification, but time is short. The, the primary question to me is, number one, how do I reduce the cost? How do I maintain reliability? And how do I uh, allow coordination to occur in a very simple fashion? Uh, it sounds hard, but I think the FCC has done something in another venue that may, in fact, help this. Uh, very, very simple. How you reduce cost, you increase volume. How do you increase volume? You make it available to the broadest spectrum of people without in, in interfering with critical use. So the first proposal I would make to the FCC is possibly they should seriously consider uh, opening up the band to commercial interests, certainly uh, to utilities and critical infrastructures, and I would argue to commercial interest in general, but secondary in the band, and secondary in the way they can be shut down instantaneously. And if I said this five years ago, uh, Chairman Powell would have looked at me like I had horns in a tail. But we're doing this now in the white space arena. Uh, in the white space arena, the radios are controlled by databases. Also, uh, to prevent inter interference with radar, at uh, 5 gigahertz, uh, unlicensed stuff is also being controlled by, by databases. So here's a proposal, and obviously, uh, just to think about. Open up to the band to as many uh, interests as are possible, and I, I would say to all commercial interests. 
only allow uh, those interests to use the band if they're registered in a database and, they, they, and that uh, database has full capability to shut them down. And obviously public safety has priority. It gives you automatic coordination. It gives you volume because one of the things which is a major, major surprise to me is since it's so close to five gigahertz, why the heck aren't the people who are building the five gigahertz chips uh, going down to 4.9? It's not very expensive, but it costs more than nothing. And they look at it and say there's not a real market. Now, if those chips could be uh, uh, created in a way that they go down to 4.9, but are created by a database and assigned by a database, I think the volume problem gets solved. I think the price gets down, and the most important uses of this spectrum we haven't thought of yet. Now, I could beat this to death, but I, uh, as I said, since I'm the last person in a long day, it's a thought. Uh, it solves a coordination problem as well because the database automatically. And I would uh, commend to the FCC that they seriously think about what they have to do to increase the volume in the band, but maintain the supremacy and the priorities with public safety. And I'll, I'll stop right there. And thank you very much to all of our panelists. I think this was a great panel. Um, and actually must have read my mind because one of the questions I was hoping to touch on um, and one of the things that we're getting um, from the folks who are participating in our webinar is concerns about cost. And I heard that touched on this morning and this afternoon and the second panel, which I keep insisting <coughs> is afternoon. So just building on, what I'd like to do is maybe starting with Dave, um, just get a, a quick reaction, not necessarily to Ed's recommendation, but, but kind of what would you do to try and decrease costs um, for use of the 4.9 gigahertz band, and were any of your recommendations tied to that, or do you think that's an area that needs to be addressed? So Dave, can I ask you to start? Sure. Um, I think my take's a little bit different than Ed. I think he does have a point that as you increase volume, obviously costs go down. But I think the main cost driver, if you look at 4.9, is trying to build it out in, say, a mesh network environment. Um, really isn't the cost of the infrastructure equipment. It's, it's the cost of the backhaul. Um, you have to have so many sites to, to cover an area that um, folks, uh, other than in very small geographic areas, uh, Brookline that was this morning was a good example of that. Uh, you just can't build them out. If you tried to build it out in my area where you have a 20,000 square mile county, it doesn't work. That's why 700 is there. So I think you take a look at 4.9 for where its strengths are, um, and, it's, and that's not in covering wide area networks. Um, but you can still uh, take a look at reducing the costs um, by getting more people just to use the band and also maybe if we can standardize a bit more on the equipment without stifling the innovation that's uh, going on in this band that would that would also help reduce the cost I think and getting away from just proprietary uh, implementations okay. so um, it's a tough issue. How do you how do you do it in this band? I, I'm not sure. Okay. Totally. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Brett, any comments? Uh, sure. I mean, I love Ed's comments, obviously, uh, and also Pam's too. Thanks for the shout out. Um, yeah, I, I think that utility companies can help to offset a lot of the costs. Uh, you know, just in terms of uh, all the resources that they can bring to bear. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously they're going to be able to, you know. Bring, drive down the cost of the equipment, but also they can provide, provide the infrastructure as well. So it's a win-win. Uh, you know, I think from a policy standpoint, I think everybody's on board with this idea. You know, it's just getting around some of the legislative language and also sort of establishing a comfort level. Um, I think that we still have a lot of talking to do in terms of how we go about providing priority access, but <clears throat> I think it can be done. Um, you know, I think the technology is out there. You know, like I said, when the commission opted against allowing utility companies in when it adopted the rules, the technology really wasn't there. At least it wasn't convinced it was there. Um, uh, today you've got modulation schemes. There's, you know, infinitely more uh, throughput that's available over that spectrum probably than there was then. I think the FCC was, you know, as Ed said, expecting that there was going to be a lot more use of the spectrum than there currently is. Um, so a lot of the uh, 
fundamental uh, understandings back then don't necessarily apply today. So I think that, you know, there's a lot of reasons why this can work from a technical standpoint as well as a policy standpoint. Dear Joe, any comments? Joe? Uh, I'll go ahead. Um, I, I think partnerships is going to be key. Um, I agree with a lot of the comments. Um, all of our Homeland Security program <coughs> that we have now requires to have partnerships, regional collaboration. Um, I see no reason why we can't partner with, with some of these others. Uh, system sharing doesn't necessarily mean that you share all your channels, uh, potentially with utilities or transportation. Um, you can share infrastructure, but not share the same channels. And I see the same thing in uh, 700 megahertz broadband, uh, because you really have two different pieces to the spectrum. You have the, the user piece, which is your ad hoc network, things like that. And you also have your infrastructure piece, which the user is agnostic to. They really don't care how it works as long as when you key the mic or use the device, it works. Joe, any comments? Uh, I'd like to say that uh, first, I don't think cost is the main impediment to adoption of the ban. I think that the lack of coordination and, and the fear of interference, I mean, again, the premise of the ban was that it was dedicated to public safety. Public safety wouldn't have to experience uh, interference from the public. And so I think that's the main driver for why it's not being used more. <clears throat> I, I agree completely with, with Ed that it's about volume. And, and you, you can't just get volume. You have to have a viability for volume. Um, so what is, how is 4.9 gigahertz going to be different and better to extract that volume? And that's where we need to get to. Uh, we've got several hundred megahertz right above it with this similar propagation characteristics that are unlicensed and everyone can use. And so what is it that 4.9 gigahertz is going to do for public safety or, you know, in, in Ed's case, the public, that other spectrum allocations won't be able to do? Uh, that's where we need to get to the volume question. Okay, thank you. What I want to do is we're actually pretty much out of time, but I want to see if there's any questions from the floor before we close out. Yeah, hi, thanks, Jennifer. Um, I'm Roger Marks. I'm with the WiMAX Forum, and I'm chair of the IEEE 802.16 Standards Group. So I just want to uh, say uh, thanks to the panel. It's been a very informative session for me to understand more about this. We've heard some discussion about standards, and certainly um, there are very viable standards that are functional in this band. And perhaps one of the things that we can look at is ways to try to uh, try to get some uh, closer feedback between some of the users in the standards development, so we can see. What's, what some of the issues are. One of the things that, that's happening in the IEEE 80216 right now is a focus on enhancement for reliability and to try to look at situations where we can route around problems like failed failures of base stations or other kind of uh, uh, solutions. And I just want to see if there's some, uh, some ideas about how we can try to um, uh, bring some of the, the needs of the public safety community into the standardization environment and, and uh, Try, try to get that feedback into the process so that we can address the problem technically. Okay, Joe. I think uh, WiMAX is a, is a great technology and it has a lot of viability in, in, in a lot of different areas. I think ultimately the question is what does public safety want to use the spectrum for? Um, and once that is answered, then the question of technology can change a bit. So, you know, Wi-Fi can support peer-to-peer um, type communications. WiMAX is more of a mobile uh, technology. It has a lot of standards already existing for mobility, full mobility, nationwide mobility even. Um, so I think, I think all of these things are important for public safety to consider. But the first question is, what do we want to use the spectrum for? Okay. Uh, let, let me uh, just add one other thing for it. Uh, standards are extremely important if you think standards will drive volume. You're making uh, the same chip rather than five, six, seven, eight, ten uh, chips, whatever, or proprietary uh, chips. But the problem with standards is exactly what Joe said. You got to figure out what you want, and when you've done it, it probably takes five years to get a standard. The net result is this has been out for a while, and people are having, uh, shall I say, proprietary systems, and it will con continue. So part of the standard process, and this is, I have no answer for this, just how do you transition to a standard even after you got one based on the legacy systems? And how do you create compatibility? The sooner you start thinking about that, the higher the probability is to, succe uh, to succeed at it. 
So, you know, I'm 100% for standards because it drives the cost down and, uh, and results in uh, commonality of chip design. But then again, it's pretty hard to get there from here. Okay, so one final and response from Brett. jump in on one important point. This is license spectrum. And 802.16 almost went off the tracks and, and devoted itself entirely unlicensed at one point. So I, I just want to emphasize that 4.9 is one of those bands where, you know, it's good that WiMAX is still in the hunt. All right. Um, so thank you, Roger. I thought we had one last. If we can make it brief, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Saunders. I work with AeroVironment. Uh, we build small unmanned airplanes. Um, our current, uh, our current uh, customer is mainly the DOD, but we are seeing an increased interest in uh, uh, policing activities, border security, disaster response, et cetera. Um, these airplanes are limited to very low altitudes. Um, the FAA is currently working on opening up airspace to allow us to fly at low altitudes, um, line of sight uh, type operations. Uh, the question for this panel would be, um, th this, this uh, usage is ideal for this type of bandwidth. It's uh, line of sight, there's no propagation issues. Um, how might we open up this bandwidth um, and address the uh, airborne waivers required and, uh, and potentially address um, this usage uh, close in uh, in this type of spectrum. Thank you. I'm not sure this is the right panel, but we'll see if anyone has an answer. Ed does. Well, uh, <laughs> Jennifer, I'd like to answer on that too. I mean, certainly you can get a waiver um, if uh, you show that it's in the interest, but you still have to solve the coordination pr uh, pro problem. So, I mean, my reaction is if I'll for a waiver when you need it and you obviously, this, I'll guarantee you uh, the first question is, is how you're going to do coordination. Plus there'll probably be other questions as well. Okay, Joe? Yeah, I, I uh, think 4.9 uh, is an excellent ban for airborne. Um, to do uh, airborne at LTE creates interference havoc. Um, so 4.9, four uh, and I've seen a lot of airborne video and it generally looks terrible. Um, and so I think if we can solve the interference problems, the coordination problems, airborne is one of the highly viable solutions for uh, uses for 4.9 gigahertz. Uh, anyone else on the panel? Yes, uh, Jennifer, oh, sorry, Dave. Dave. Yep. Um, yeah, just more to echo, but I think if you combine it with solving the coordination issues, relook at it and say, and make it a use where you don't have to go after a waiver, I think it would help a, a whole lot. And I think that's doable. We should ta certainly take a look at that. Okay, great. Well, um, we're running out, thank you, we're running out a little late, so I'm going to thank our panel. Um, it was a, I thought it was a great panel. We appreciate your time and coming out here. Um, and with that, I was going to introduce our closing speaker, who's Julie Knapp, who's the current um, head of the Office of Engineering and Technology at the FCC. So with that, Julie. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody who participated today. I, I thought it was a terrific session, and I hope everybody in the room learned uh, something com coming out of this that they might not have uh, known before. Um, it felt a little bit like old home week for how many of us were talking about that we were there when this started, <laughs> uh, and I was one of them. Uh, the one thing that didn't get mentioned is that this is 50 megahertz of spectrum that was transferred from the federal government <laughs> as a result of the 93 Budget Act. And uh, we have a particular obligation because when I meet with the federal folks, they say, gee, what's going on with that spectrum that you transferred? <laughs> and uh, we really have an obligation to make as uh, good use of it. Um, I won't repeat, this was originally uh, planned for auction. Uh, we had followed a course to make it available for public safety. We're really about eight years into where the, from the time that the rules were first adopted, and depending on your perspective, that's either a long time or a relatively short time. Uh, certainly the perception when we set up the rules with, was a heavy focus on incident manage, management, and the one thing you learn in this business is that things don't always turn out the way you planned. Um, I think coming into today, for many of us, there was a perception that there's, the band's not heavily used. Uh, there's, th there is a lot more going on here, I think, uh, listening to the presentations than people appreciated. Um, we heard about backhaul, video surveillance, uh, systems that are even being built out over wide areas. 
uh, different kinds of technologies that are being used, 802.11 versions, .16 versions. Uh, the good news, I, the things I heard were uh, high quality of service, that it's reliable, robust, and the cost is low, which is always music to the ears of people who don't have a lot of money to work with uh, to begin with. Uh, mostly focused on fixed, uh, and, and of course that goes with the nature of the propagation at this band and building penetration and so forth, but I would also not be so quick to dismiss mobile from the standpoint of, as uh, I think one of, one of the presentations had focused on a complement to other technologies, and I just draw the parallel to what's going on on the commercial wireless side, where we've got uh, essentially anchors that provide ubiquitous wide area coverage in the commercial bands, now married with Wi-Fi capability, so if I'm close to a hotspot, it offloads the traffic from the wide area network. I may have more bandwidth to work with, which gives me the opportunity for higher speeds. So when we think about 700 in public safety and 4.9, you could easily conceive of a similar be mutual benefit. You know, 4.9 is not going to give you the wide area ubiquitous coverage and all of the building penetration, but when you start thinking about it in terms of uh, maybe not while you're in motion, but while you're stopped and you've got access to uh, whether it be a hotspot or a, a, a fixed link, that you can do things that we heard about like updating databases, checking licenses, and so forth. Um, we had a lot of ideas for the FCC, I think, to take back and think about uh, advertisement. We don't call it advertising at the FCC. We call it education. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I think, again, listening to it here, uh, I, I heard a lot of different things that I didn't know were going on, and maybe part of the exercise here is taking that and conveying it to the entire community and say, aha, I didn't realize anybody was able to do this. Um, Coordination. We heard a lot about coordination today and interference management. There's a balance, I think, between uh, coordination and uh, perhaps not reverting to the real detailed and costly kind of coordination we see in the Part 101 fixed bands. We've done, uh, I would only just draw your attention to, we've done different approaches in different bands. We've done licensing light, for example, at 3650, where we didn't have a formal coordination requirement, but we had a registration database that where everybody knew where everybody else was, which made it easier <laughs> to uh, coordinate things. So it, it does seem like there's uh, uh, an area of focus there on how we can improve coordination altogether without making it too burdensome or uh, limiting fle flexibility. We heard about an interest in expanding the eligibles, including, uh, I think last uh, I had mentioned commercial interests uh, on a secondary basis. Uh, we heard about standards, and I think what, what I was hearing there is the tension between the flexibility to, pr to introduce new technologies and then how do you make them all play nice together. Uh, I, I don't think anybody is suggesting that we should try to narrow things down to one particular technology, but really it it's goes hand in hand with this issue of the uh, coordination and interference management. And then lastly, uh, if, uh, airborne use. So just a couple things in closing out. Uh, there's plenty of room to grow here. Uh, and part of what I was listening to is an evolving ecosystem between vendors who are developing innovative applications, conveying those to public safety, public safety having the confidence that those are going to meet their requirements and help complement uh, their needs. We really need to have a, a, a way to encourage that. We're seeing innovation. Uh, it's a bit uneven, I think. Uh, one of the things I was a little concerned about as I listened to some of the presentations is that we not fall back into same old, same old. There's, there's a temptation when you've got 50 megahertz to say, well, I won't worry too much about efficiency <laughs> because my signal, you know, so I'll just take up uh, 20 megahertz when really with a, you know, a little bit of attention I might be able to, to do the same thing in five. <laughs> So somehow we have to convey, I think, uh, yeah, 50, depending on your perspective, again, may be a lot or a little, but we have to be efficient in how we use it. Uh, also, there's an opportunity for synergy with the other bands. I mentioned 700. 
Uh, we, we talked about five gigahertz. When all this was done, there was 300 megs available under the uni rules for uh, at five gigahertz, and now it's 555. <laughs> so it, it just, w when the rules were being developed, there was a lot of focus on the potential for synergy between the Wi-Fi uh, version A or later H um, and uh, 4.9. Uh, it makes a lot of sense to, to take advantage of that. Uh, some of the applications may re require a lot of bandwidth, and the room is there at 5. 4.9 is the, may be the space that y is your go-to spot if there's interference in the other places. You put the two together, and you've got an awful lot of bandwidth. Uh, and I'd also mention, because you know, people are interested in some of the other things that are going on, there was no mention today about 3650 and its role in all this for backhaul, and the TV white spaces that have been opened up. We've heard a lot of interest from municipalities doing some of the things that we talked about today. So you start putting all these things together in a toolkit, and it becomes much more powerful than any one uh, alone. So. Uh, you know, we've been focusing a lot here at the Commission on jobs and innovation and so forth, and it struck me here that we've got uh, a lot of room for innovation and jobs and building these networks, and most importantly, meeting public safety requirements. So it can be a win-win-win for everybody. And the uh, trick here is figuring out a way to uh, work together so that we, we get there. So with that, I think we're done and we can get lunch. We ended on time, about 12.15, and I want to thank you all for participating. And a round of applause for our last panel.